Welcome to the Bronx Aerosol Arts Documentary Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is May 23rd, 2022. Um, Kurt, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself before... Yeah, uh, we... I'm Kurt. I've been writing about urban culture for uh, 40 years. Great. Thank you, Kurt. And we're really happy to be here today with Sen One, uh, who is a legendary graffiti writer um, from a part of New York that uh, uh, unfortunately ra rarely gets the love um, as far as uh, as far as graffiti goes or other other elements of hip hop culture, and Sen One is a member of the incredible Bombing Masters, the IBM crew, um, among other uh, groups leading up to that, and uh, um, we're just happy to be here uh, today with Sen One. So uh, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your family's history and background, and um, how they ended up in New York City, whatever you know about that history. Absolutely. Um... Well, I'm raised with a single mother, um, her name is Mercedes Murillo, and we come out of the island that's Haiti, now is known as Dominican Republic, but at that time it wasn't, when she migrated here, it wasn't, it was, it just had went through the changes. And um, if you look up the Murillo family line, we actually are the original military under, the, it was a militia actually that ran, Murillo Lopez, it was a militia that ran from Haiti throughout Haiti to the other end of the island, there was two militias. When they when the, when the CIA in the United States, whatever, in, in, put in Trujillo, which was the dictator, sure. actually recruited uh, my grandfather's militia, which is where we get our entire military family. So as a kid, um, so my mother eventually had to flee over some of the turmoils that happened, I think, um, and I think she didn't flee, actually. She came, there was a time when they fled. That was my brother, actually. I think it was in the 1950s something when they had um, some kind of, I think the United States jumped in or 19, no, it was 1960s when the United States jumped in and my brother was in school there and he had, actually he had to flee. But prior to that, because of our relationship with government and military, my mother, the youngest out of um, 12, and a bunch of half of the family, half of the siblings came to the United States because they were tied in with the with the government stuff that was happening. The other side stood running the government uh, military. So my grandfather and then my uncles eventually become the entire heads of the military or the national police. So that's the reason I kind of like grew up knowing the whole history of being Aboriginal of Haiti and and there was no and the division that eventually would come in once they established Dominican Republic and the mulattoes, the half mix under Trujillo's and his rule of killing off the Haitians out of that part of the island, the pure bloods I would say because we still the same bloodlines, but we're mixed blood and he chose to kill off the more of the original Aboriginals. And um so yeah, so I always grew up knowing that I grew up with the my mother being um very, um, I would say, uh, connected. Um, as you see to these days, I still wear my stuff. She's really into the whole, what people call voodoo and whatever, Santeria culture and stuff, but we really naturals, um, connected. I feel everything, I feel energy. I saw things as a kid, um, and she's always um, practiced and kept me in line with that. And um, and we moved, she moved to the, to. I had uncles and aunts that moved to um, different parts of the city. So we had people in Lower East Side, family. And then we had my main, my, the, my oldest aunt. She was um, on 141st in Hamilton. And my mother then, re -re she relocated on Amsterdam and 94th Street between 94th and 95th Street in a tenement. And then that's where I would be born. My brother's seven years older than me. We had different fathers, but he didn't know his father. I didn't know my father. So, um, but I got my mother's last name. I kept the Murillo last name. Um, he didn't. And then anyway, um, we would, um, I was born in um, St. Luke's. They changed the name now, um, but it's close to Harlem Hospital. I think, um, it's by Columbia. Um, at that time, 1968, um, well, I guess I wouldn't remember that too much, but growing up in the 70s, it was, um, it was heavy, heavy, the city was in a mess, um, meaning like there was a lot of crime, but not as much as we have today, like the shootings and stuff like that. It was more like there was, um, you just had to be on your toes, like everything, it was just the way New York was. Like if you came to New York, you had to, like they used to say back then, 
the strong survive, survival of the fittest. Like there'll be like three card monsters. It was just everybody was just hustling, trying to get over on everybody and anybody. And you had to kind of like adapt yourself to survive in that atmosphere of having your instincts. So it's like it's like getting locked up and going to jail. Um, other inmates are gonna prey on inmates that they know they can prey on, and not prey on the ones that either know their way around know the behavior code or ready to fight. So that's, I guess that's the laws of any jungle, any wilderness, right? An animal doesn't really go after an animal that might hurt him if, or her. It would rather go after prey that it knows it could, you know. So that's the way the streets was. It was kind of like you looked at people in their eyes. If you felt like somebody was scheming you, like you was ready to fight, whether you was a 90-year-old lady, you just let people know you're not taking my purse without a fight yeah. and it kind of like that was like the first line of defense so i kind of like learned that from my mother she was um really like a strong caribbean um violent she had me at 41 though so i got lucky because because um i got i got the violent part but not her prime as my brother <laughs> Your did brother got my that brother part. got that part yeah, seven years younger brother? yeah seven yeah. yeah seven years younger yeah so he is older yeah and i'm younger so um but yeah, she was like, I mean, she hit you with anything she'd get her hands on, like, <laughs> like anything, knives, she'd throw knives at me, stab me, done it all. Um, but it was, it was, um, again, it was, it was a way of preparing you for what was out there. So it didn't, it didn't even hold grudges. Like as you grew up, you actually appreciated it because um, getting those beatings when you're young um, and then going in the streets and getting those beatings, you kind of like had build a shell for it. And build the strength and the endurance for it, and no fear. Actually, in the, in, the, in the time it came to be for me, um, joyful to get stitched up and cut up. Like it felt, it felt good in a way. Like it's crazy, it's crazy yeah. as it sounds. But you growing up all your life being hit, you be basically don't don't even feel that anymore. You actually take it, and you proud you took it. It's yeah. like almost like absorbing energy. You just yeah, and it just comes out. So, so you, George, what was your uh, elementary school years like? And where, where'd you go? Um, I was one of those kids. My brother, he was more of a genius. He had a photogenic memory. He was incredible. He got, he, he passed everything. Like, he just so gifted. Like, incredible. I was the opposite. So, I went to, I went to um, elementary school. I was getting thrown out of every school. So, I went to PS 75. I got thrown out of there. I went to PS 84. I got thrown out of there. Where were they located? Just around. So PS 75 is located on 95th Street and 96th Street and West End. Mm -hmm. PS 84 was on Columbus and 92nd Street. Mm -hmm. And then I was eventually sent to Holy Names, which is, 90, is Catholic school on 96th Street. And I was thrown out of there. Um, I basically made it through those, those schools maybe no more than a year or two before yeah. I would get thrown out. And was I, there a particular reason? You just, you I was dyslexic. Oh, I had a lot of energy. Oh, yeah, okay. um, I was always spaced out. I was in my own little world. Um, I was a really like fun going kid. And again, that didn't really, even with the teachers, it wasn't really like some people were really angry back then, really aggressive. So if you was like, like an innocent kid, like just want to have fun, that was like, you was, you was like beat up for that. Like other kids would put, either bully you or even the teachers and back then the teachers could hit you yeah. and they would hit you and the catholic teachers were the worst i mean these people beat you like so then i eventually got sent to a boarding school in jersey called sacred heart because i was just out of control so what happened with me was that i was this really like like cool kid that was in my own little world like i'd be one of those kids that'd be singing and, and just doing my own thing class i couldn't really focus i couldn't learn i couldn't um i didn't know how to read i, I had trouble reading um and um, because of that, I was always in trouble. And then that frustration, I had this hidden temper. So although I couldn't really fight that good, but once that temper went, it was over for anybody that was around because I'd pick up things, I would throw things, I hit people with rocks, bricks, whatever I got my hands on. Mm -hmm. Like once that happened, and there was no stopping me. Like I'll just destroy the entire room. So it'd be this little kid just going nuts. I mean, nuts. And you couldn't come, you couldn't bring me down once that happened. So that eventually was one of my my problems, my downfalls and like school stuff. But it would be my survival mechanism in life. Because that temper, actually being able to, that happen and go into this blind fury. Actually, I survived. Yeah. I survived everything because I had that. But it wasn't something I controlled. 
It was something that was kick that would kick in, and once it kicked in, like I said, there was no stopping it. Yeah. So I didn't need skills. I was crazy. Like once that happened, I was crazy. So it was basically I I, I used to always look at the Hulk and think about how that was like me as a little kid. Like as a kid, I used to watch that character and be like, damn, because I would definitely turn into this blind monster and and go crazy. So and then I was skinny and small. So. Um, so I was, in, in Jersey in a boarding school, what was that? Like? Ooh, man, that was... That How'd was, you get there from, from so, home? So we was in, in, a, in a tenement on 94th Street in Amsterdam, um, 201, two, 200, two, 200 West 94th Street. The next door was this project called, um, um, it's 201, but it was, it's called um, De La Hostos Project. But that project housed, it was, they used to call it back then Vietnam and Korea because it housed the, out, the outlaw gang called... Um, um, how could I forget the name, Sam? Just my mind is going a thousand. Um, um, that's crazy. The sand, the Sandman. Oh, the Sandman. The okay. Sandman. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the Sandman. They're, they're a motorcycle. Yeah, they were like okay, right? yeah at the time, but that's the outlaws. Yeah, the outlaws yeah, yeah, mimic. Sure. They took that whole identity from, but they didn't necessarily all have motorcycles. They had some choppers, but yeah. it was they were so poor. But the Sandmans were like, woof, like. You want to talk about outlaw gangs, but like Chingalings and all these dudes, the same way. But they were like vicious. I mean, vicious. And they had girls, and they were diverse. And they had a lot of girls, women that were like the toughest women you ever see in your life. And they ran that shit. I mean, they were hardcore. I mean, Penthouse did an interview. I mean, an article on them. I mean, it's crazy on the rooftop of that building. So that building was like notorious. Like you lived in the building. I lived right next door. Right next door. To you right it. Next to but we wasn't even allowed. My mother. You wasn't even allowed to go around a corner to where the building. There was a parking lot to the project. Yeah, yeah. And that you had, and my window basically in the kitchen faced that. I was in a rail, roll, what is it, rail, railroad, railroad flat or whatever. Yeah. You call it. yeah so yeah, it was yeah. a long apartment with like three bedrooms, which was also scary as, as hell in the seventies because there was so much crime going in. People climbing. We're on the second floor. People climbing into your house. You hear noises. But there was also these old. That's why I love the structure here. It was really an old structure. So you would see things. Like like there was like energy, like spiritual energy. Like you would see faces in the walls. You would see things move. You would hear noises. Like it was it was a different, it was a weird situation to grow up in. Yeah. And everything was still the same. Like the doors to the rooms would be little windows. Like it was really classical, but it carried all that energy. And um and being from an energy type of family, that's you know, you felt all that. Yeah. You saw all that. And it, it made you crazy as a kid. Like you was like, like it was a lot of stuff happening. And then my moms would do things as a side also. So because we come out of the high military family, my mother was a, uh, even though she migrated here, she had a she had educa a big educational background. She was a she was ahead of the game because she was involved with like computer stuff. So she was a single mom. So it was hard for her. and as a as a black woman at that time because that's what she was. She you know it was difficult for her with a single mother with two kids. So he was looked down upon, and she was really a classy woman. But she worked as a data processor, and she was originally part of um, the um, Jewish Appeal, what was the United Jewish Appeal? Oh, United but Jewish I was a kid. Yeah. yeah, I was young. And then later on, she'll be on with Singer, the corporation, so that made the sewing machines, but the corporate. So and she was with that for a long time. So that goes into the story, which I'll tell you. So what happened with the boarding school was that I was getting in so much trouble, and. Um, and get kicked out that my mom's going to work trying to handle this and you know teenage son running around with my brother Ricky and then me like it just drove her crazy then she also had a social life so what she so a friend of hers told her her son was in this boarding school so prior to that what happened let me just say something so prior to that I went to Holy Names the first time I learned how to read I have to include this because it starts to change everything I couldn't never learn how to read I couldn't get it and a nun took me up, so this is a good nun compared to the other ones. She took me upstairs one day to a classroom, an empty room, and she kind of like knew what was wrong with me in a way. And what she did was she grabbed the book, which is really interesting. She grabbed a book, a really simple book, and I think it was either C Spot Run or Curious George. It was one of the two. Uh -huh. and, um, and what she did was she turned the book upside down and gave it to me and asked me to read. And then I began to read. Yeah. So dyslexic, she'd figured out that. So I eventually, the first way I learned how to read was reverse backwards, upside down. Oh. So actually to this day, I could write 
in reverse. And I do I do my E's sometimes. And like my, that. my N, yeah. my little N, if you see my tag, I do a small N, but it's really like a big N in reverse because of that. But it helped me a lot because that's one of the issues I had. So between that and graffiti, it helped cure that because yeah. um, graffiti, you had to practice the letters and numbers. And because I have the S and the E, those are the main letters as a person with dyslexic, dyslexic. And at that time, they didn't diagnose you. They didn't have those diagnoses. Yeah. But those are the main, those are the type of letters that you have trouble with. So having that in my name and having to rep, you know, repetitiously wow. do it. But I could remember in the beginning getting them mixed up and confused, doing them backwards mm -hmm. or getting confused because the direction they were going. So, you know, having a name like Send, Sender, mm -hmm. you learned which way the S goes, wow. which way the E goes. So in a way, those are the ways I cured that aspect. And then I became a reader later on in life and I love to read and I would read everything possible to this day. I just love reading. I got a library, an incredible library. Okay, but, so, so you went to... Uh, so I go to boarding school. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so I go to boarding school. Sacred Heart is in Jersey, and it's a big compound. Um, this is like 1974, maybe. So I was like maybe was five, six years old, because my birthday's in October, the end of October, October 28th. So sometimes in the years, I'm only transitioning to the age. So yeah. most of the year, I'm younger than most guys. You know, so, five months. So, uh, was I, so you went to three, you went to three elementary, so was you like fourth grade when you hit the uh, boarding school? Something like that, fourth or fifth. Fourth, 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 fourth grade. Fifth. He had to wear No, 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 fourth. Yeah, it must have been fourth because when I came back, I went to, um, I think that's when I, no. Yeah, no, you might be right. No, no, because I went to Connecticut for a year. No, so you're right. Oh, you're four, right. five, six. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So we, and then at that point, we already moved to two tenements. And then by the time I go to the boarding school, what happens is we move up to Columbus to a 34 building, 30 floor building. That's a Michelama building. Oh, okay. So we moved up. She applied, and well, they were building the building. As soon as it opened up, we wanted the early families to move in. Um, now we're going from a tenement with four floors and three apartments on each floor. Everybody knowing each other to me entering this 30 floor building with thousands of people in it on Columbus Avenue and from 93rd Street to 92nd Street on Columbus 100 West 93rd um, and it was self run there was no security guards no nothing everybody was just in there it was like it was crazy and then so I moved into that building um, across the street is where Frosty Freeze lives on Columbus Avenue lived mm -hmm. and and that's where Chino, the leader of the Familia, Familia actually right across the street. So Familia comes out in 1974. They're offspring off the Sandmans mm -hmm. and, uh, and a Familia from Brooklyn. So there's an original. So the original Familia in Brooklyn, Chino, he was a <coughs> member of that and a member of the Sandmans. He was groomed by the Sandmans and the Young Lords. So he's connected because of his history with all the, the Chingalings, the Savage Skulls, the the Savage Nomads, um, Black Spades. I mean, he's connected to all that. So I know Bam because of that that relationship with Bam Bada and all those dudes from when we was little kids. They were all coming to my neighborhood. We was all going to Harlem World and, and the rooftop and all these places, little kids. You was going around all these places, right? So, and you meet, and all these people was coming in our neighborhood. So, if we get into the context, okay, you're in elementary school, there's all this activity. Um, Obviously, you you know you're learning how to read, but uh, uh, just to keep it simple, so that we can like, I just want to understand how how what was those days like in New York as in elementary school, just surviving that and just you know eventually you're going to come into art and we'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. But you know you you didn't you didn't go into little league baseball. You didn't no. play basketball. No, Did no. you play handball? Like what was what was your outlet? No boxing or. No, nah, I was I was a kid, so my spine was like bent in. I had narrow shoulders. I was like totally non-athletic, like the kids were. Yeah. But you had to keep up. The yeah, kids yeah, in the yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. little by little, I, I developed. My brother was out of here. I mean, he was doing flips. He was doing skateboard, like the Zoo York stuff, building ramps. He was just he was out of here. Me was more like my mother. First of all, was like had me like a mama's boy in a way. Like kept me close because again I had issues. I was always in trouble. Some some was going on. So at that time she was dating a mechanic that lived a street mechanic, but he had his little basement garage part of our building, and he was from Peru. And so I would like 
work with him a little bit at the garage and his spare time. But we sit and we sat around. I mostly got teased because like my brother's crew, they were older and he would have to take me along. So of course he wasn't happy about it. So he would bully me when I was in a, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then his friends would do it. But then they, but then I was so wild. They, they knew that I eventually, like to them it would be funny because eventually I'll start picking up bottles and throwing it at them and throwing rocks at them. And then to, to them it was like, so it was like that type of youth. It was where I kind of like felt outcast in a way. But then I was always trying to, like, again, I was in my own little world and it was still fun because his friends still, and, and my brother as well, still show me some love. You know what I mean? So it wasn't like they were just, you know, and then to me, I saw it as the same way when my mom's be beat me. It was just like, that was the type of love we was giving each other. Yeah. So even my brother's friends, you know, they, if they saw me at that time, the community looked out for each other. So everybody looked out for each other. So you, so at least with that, um, you never felt really unsafe they so bullied what, you what your brother do then what kind of stuff he was into when he brought you along my brother was he was he was an artist really young he he um my mother we got it from my mother my brother from uh, he was always cool he's always into school but he was out there like people knew him but not as he could fight though but people he he was just a cool dude my brother everybody in the neighborhood loved my brother and he was like he was like frosty freeze they were like street like the streets loved them. The neighborhood loved them because they were like the entertainment for the for the neighbors. So back then, life was slower. Everybody be outside and stoop stuff like that. And then you had certain kids that were doing you know mischievous stuff, which the neighborhood hated, yeah. right? Like these oh, man, these kids are always up to no good. Then you had groups of kids that were like skateboarding, doing tricks, and doing stuff. And the neighborhood liked those kids because they were, you know, even though they were in the streets doing stuff and, and doing stuff, they wasn't really like doing um, messed up things or things that I guess grown ups could foresee that that's going to be a bad person. So my brother was one of those kids that like was, and this would bring up New York, would be like coming down a hill, doing headstands on his skate skateboards, um, jumping over cars, you know, and, and on his skateboards, like and competing with each other. So the neighborhood loved that. Like that was the entertainment. You sit on a stoop and you got certain kids that are actually doing some. Steve, the um, evil Knievel stunts. It's like the cool stuff, you know. You know, summer, yeah. like you know, and so my. So you're watching. You're hanging out. You're yeah, watching. I'm watching all this, and I loved it because even though I couldn't do all that stuff, right. I never felt the pressure. I always felt like an extension of my brother. Okay. That my, since my no, brother was doing it, I got it. You know, yeah. that's I'm. It's like yeah. I'm doing it. Like yeah, it's that's like right. it's, yeah. that's my brother. You yeah, know what I mean? Right. Like I got, I feel you so, yeah. but with New York, but he so he would take me to the New York thing. Um, and those are great memories because he had to drag me along. But they had a hill in Riverside Park by the monument um, on like 91st and Riverside, which is called Suicide Hill. And um, and it splits, but it, it it has this it has this pull. It's like a magnetic pull. Like it's such a steep steep hill, but it's something different about it that it actually like even when you walk in it, mm -hmm. you could feel. Like even walking up it, it's pulling you. It's just, so that the, it splits to where it goes, it's steep and it goes all the way down, then it splits, right? It was called Suicide Hill because when you, if you took the long route, most people it would eat it, would just, they would not make it. Right. So the, even the older kids were like, that was their, their like Andy Kessler, them, that was their like, their challenge, right? So specifically on this one day, I'll tell you this story because it's crazy to show you how my brother had his hands full. So my brother's seven years old and they doing this stuff. I'm supposed to always turn on the little, on the on the off hill. Like, so it goes steep and then it turns, right? This one goes straight. I decide, I'm, I'm, I'm about like six, like six, seven years old. I decide I'm not turning, I'm riding this, right? So I, I go down the hill, he was not even watching me. And on then a board, on a skateboard, on a skateboard right? right? And I'm going down. And remember, I'm not as athletic as my brother either. I'm just crazy. I'm just like, I'm just the nut kiddies. So I go down, and as I'm going down, I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm doing this. I'm going, right? And then I heard, as soon as I passed the little ramp and I'm going down, I could hear the other Zoo York cats and my brother's friends, look at your little brother, yo. <laughs> right? And then my brother's like, no. And I'm already, I'm already flying. Do you know I make it to the bottom and I don't know if it was a stick or an acorn or something. Oh, I caught the shit. wheel. I flew. I flew. <laughs> I landed. Scraped everything you could imagine. 
<laughs> was all ripped up, sawed up, and my brother was just like, <laughs> and he came, picked me up, I was all bloody, and then he was yelling at me because he knew that my mother was going to whip his ass when he got home. So he was just like, and that was, it like, it destroyed his whole day. Like, he had to now take me all bloody. Oh, and all his friends thought it was funny and cool. Like, they were just like, yo, he's crazy. That was dope, you know, because I made it to the bottom. But um, I ate it. But that's that's what my brother had to endure. And then he brought me home. And and he was mad. My mother was mad. She, I, I'm not sure if she hit him, but I know he got in trouble. And then, um, and I know I got manhandled from him, bringing me home all cut up. Come on, come on. <laughs> and then when I got home, I think my mother was kind of like, you know, crying going crazy i drove my mother crazy but so then so then getting back to the boarding school sorry i jumped around so when i moved up the block like you said it went from two worlds Amsterdam and broadway that's where we was at right was one world and it was kind of like it was still short buildings tenements and like i said the look that big gang was next door and i was the biggest pride building which was a project and i think i had like 20 five, 24 floors or something like that and it was a big project but it's singular and then that's where Fable lives now. And then um, Broadway was like, it was uh, not gang. So though back then, gangs had their territories. All those blocks were controlled by certain gangs. Um, Broadway was considered um, um, like civilian zone. It wasn't like really a part of anybody's community. It was yeah. like all the shopping areas and all that stuff. So everybody would migrate down there. 96th Street had um, um, clubs still. Back then, because it was a um, Afro land jazz, so they had Broadway Ochentas, they had Broadway ninety six, they had all these clubs. Eventually, they knocked them down. They were, so Broadway mostly had one story stores like Woolworths and all that. They were just all one stories. They eventually would knock all that down and build them high rise. So Broadway was real. Everything was more lower. As you got up to Columbus and Central Park, that's where the buildings were higher up. Mm. And then Central Park had the older high buildings like Riverside. So these are like pre-war buildings, but they were the big pre-war buildings, yeah. right, with doormans and stuff. So I was going to ask you about that because, you know, as a messenger, I visited a lot of these buildings, any doorman building, but it's for the super rich. So you're really close to that upper scale part in New York, which you obviously call Upper West Side, but you, you said you didn't call it that back then. That was but, considered like Lower Harlem. Lower Harlem, but it was some rich, you know, living on... 85th well, Street, you know, oh yeah, as you went road. further, as you went a little further, yeah, it did. We was on the borderline of that, and I think that's what made us unique, even with the drug trade and stuff like that, was that we had the both worlds. Yeah. And even with my brother and his friends, they skating in Riverside Park. Um, you you skating with rich kids. The rich you know? kids, right, right. Yeah, yeah. and they, yeah, but yeah, they, yeah. but at that time, they're not rich like they are rich today. Oh, they were, they go. were rich, like rich, more stable than we was. But they were in the streets with us. So oh, like the Zephyrs and them and all, they they in the streets. They white kids, but they in the streets. They not they not like white kids. They are not like like what you think today of like white kids. Nah, they'll yeah, be yeah. like they'll yeah. be like what people might say a white trash today. Let's just yeah. use for yeah. terminology, like just okay. for terminology. Right. They'll be looked down. They had their hair long. They coming out of the hippie era. They skateboard. They got patches on their pants like us, you know. And then you go to their houses. They were like real. Their parents would be like real cool. Like it wasn't like. Like, no, don't be, you know, if anything, it was more like people were more eager to get along with each other. I don't know if maybe because the hippie movement had just passed and the, and the whole civil rights movements and stuff. I don't know if that's what it was, but we didn't really have that separation. And, and even the rich, and then you still had snobby rich people. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but it was really a minority. And so you, and even like I said, in those buildings, like you go to Central Park West and let's say 9th Third Street right now, doorman building, expensive. We'll have friends that live there. So you'll be going to visit them and vice versa. So you kind of like, because you kind of like was able not to fall down a rabbit's hole of being too ghetto, even if you live next to a construction site, um, abandoned building or a junkyard, because of the fact that everybody basically visit each other, spend time with each other, and you basically never spend time at home. You basically everywhere else. Yeah. So you'd be outside, you'd be here, you go out to school with your friend to his house, you eat, you don't have food at home, you eat with him. You know what I mean? This and that. So it kind of like balances itself out as a community. And that's what was nice about it. Hot hip hop, that, that mixture early on was the fact that, and the vision, because we was able to see that lifestyle in a cool way, not 
you don't belong here or you shouldn't be here. Now nah, you didn't feel that. Yeah. You know, the parents were like, would you consider like what they would say liberal today? But genuine, maybe more genuine back then. It was more sincere. Hmm. They'll bring you in and it was like real. Like you wouldn't feel like they just like treating you a certain way because whatever. They, they were basically, yeah, come in, come on. They were just nice people. And then because the world, the way the world fell on the outside, um, people had to behave like that. They looked for that. People wanted to be really neighbory, real, but genuine. Yeah. Like you could trust your neighbor because somebody could climb in through your fire escape at night and you need your neighbor and vice versa. But it was genuine. Like they wouldn't break into your house. They wouldn't scheme. That came later with the crack and stuff. So we caught a very early time when like you could leave ba people could babysit your kids and watch your kids and not molest them and stuff like that and do all that stuff you could b basically trust that because all of that the community took care of so the cops wasn't really involved they were involved with whatever they were doing with the mm. mob and all that all the other crap you know the drug stuff so they didn't come into the community for that so the community had to rely on itself so when your community had to rely on itself um, there was a trust that was there that, that was, and you didn't, of course you didn't get it with everybody, but people knew who to stay away from, who you couldn't trust, and overall, everybody could be trusted when it came to that, and with kids. And what would happen in the neighborhood was that there was Perry justice back then, uh, meaning that the community would, would handle his business. So if somebody did something to somebody that was considered out of line, so there was rules in the streets back then. So you basically had to know the, street, the rules. So, and that's why you had outlaw gangs. They basically, they did whatever they wanted away, and they, even they had their rules. Yeah. So with them was like, and that's where the no snitching comes from. It didn't come from no snitching that because you don't want to tell about a murderer that lives next door to you. That, that's the example they say today, right? When you say that. No, it had to do because you couldn't trust the police, for yeah. one. The police was committing most of the crime. They were connected to the mob. The neighborhoods would control um, we broke that out, the young, this my generation, because we were stick up kids. But prior to us, every bodega had a number joint in the back that was controlled by the mob. Yeah. Right? You had these businesses. In my neighborhood, we still had Italian businesses. We had Jewish businesses. We had the Jewish mob. We had the Italian mob. We had the Westies and Hell's Kitchen, the Irish mob. And then we had our, our internal people. You know, we had our own numbers and our own number runners. And we had, so it was a different world where the community had to like, Everybody had to coexist, even with their hustles, and you didn't get involved in other people's stuff. But at the same time, in order for all that to work, there had to be rules that had to be followed by everybody. Yeah. And if you crossed those rules and did things, you was getting it from anybody and every, and sometimes by everybody. Yeah. So if you rape somebody, the neighbor was going to come and get you. And you was either going to get killed on the spot, beat to death. I watched that as a kid. They stabbed in front of my brothers in the back that came from Harlem to rob because my neighbor was always enticing people to come from other areas to rob. They stabbed this kid, um, robbing him. And the neighborhood, when I was little, I seen it. They grabbed one of the dudes, the other guy got away, and they beat that guy to death. I mean, he was dead. By the time the cops came, the mob was already clearing out. And the cops looked around, what happened here? They knew he wasn't from here. Somebody say he robbed somebody, boom, they just take the body and that was it. No investigation, no nothing. It was considered community justice. It wasn't like somebody just went and beat somebody. So it's something that you would get in a third world still. Like somebody breaks into your house and people go in the neighborhood, catch them, they beat them, burn them, whatever. That's what happened back then. So basically that basic. But because it was that basic, less things would happen. You understand? So, and if it happened, it still could happen. But... It wouldn't happen within your world. You could go into your neighborhood, sit on your stoop, and be safe because there was always somebody watching, always somebody in their fire escape, always some. And the minute anything happened, people would start coming out, people would start saying things. It wasn't gonna happen. Yeah. You understand? So, and and then you had some bad dudes back then and some mm -hmm. bad girls back then. And because they were so bad, like tough, but they were good-hearted. And then we had a lot of older cats that. That, I, that guided me, that were actually of color, they were actually hitmen for the mob throughout the 70s. But these guys would keep you out of the mix. Yeah. So they see you and they'll be the ones telling you. But they were serious dudes. They wasn't like these petty, they killers. You know what I mean? And for the mob. So they making not only good money, but their minds are different. <laughs> They're not on the level of, of acting. Up. <clears throat> and people know, don't fuck with them. And these will be the guys to grab you and take you under their wing 
and keep you protected too. And they'll make sure, and they and it could go both ways. It could be where they tell you to stay away from certain. Why you're not in school? Go to school. Boom, boom. So they 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 kept you in line, but also they saw you with a group of kids, and they knew that that group of kids was about tr nothing but trouble, and you wasn't really you getting caught up. They'll be the ones to even come and tell you to stay away from that crew or threaten the crew. Yo, leave that kid. I don't want to see him hanging out with y'all. If I see him hanging out with y'all again, I'm gonna fuck y'all. You know what I mean? And then that would be where they, they'll leave you alone. So that was a way of also, if you're not built for it, you shouldn't be in it, you won't be in it. Because there'll be many obstacles, Why, unlike today, where they'll grab these young kids that shouldn't be in things. And these older dudes put them in, like Bloods, Crips and stuff, put them in positions where they shouldn't be. That's not who they are genetically. They just not, that's not who they are. And then that's why you have the issue with snitching and, and kids going to jail and, and doing stupid things. Because they not they wasn't supposed to be there to begin with. Mm. That's not for you. The drug trade was the same way back then. It was controlled by a couple of big heads in the neighborhood. And they controlled it all. And that was it. You didn't get involved with that. I mean, they would have their little nephews or little kids that they knew. And they will take them under their wing, groom them. And they'll do the deliveries and stuff. But it wasn't every kid. You yeah. couldn't go and start selling drugs. Are you crazy? Yeah. Forget it. So you, you come out of elementary school, right? You're getting older. You're so older. I'm, yeah. You're coming out, and you know, obviously graffiti's all over the place by that time. Well, that's what, that's like what eighty one, eighty two. Nah, nah. So oh, maybe. so I, I'm sorry, I bounced it off, but I, I, I'll do it real close, quick. Close, close so up. then what happens is, so for me, we move up to that tenth, that that big building, right, that thirty floor. That changes everything. Because Columbus Avenue now, now needs more people. It's a bigger territory. And then 1974, you have Familia that runs that area up there. And it's a bigger territory. It's not just one building. They control it from the border, 96th Street, down to like 80-some Street. Then there was a, group, a gang down there called the Mosquitos and all that. But they couldn't, Familia was, was like a mafia. So you're in elementary school and you understand the language. And when you leave, when you go to the streets... You understand what's going on well, on the streets per se. Yeah, that this is gang turf. Yeah, in, in a sense. Well, you you knew it the moment you knew it just from your mother schooling you. Like you just oh, knew. Oh, okay. Yeah, you just knew. Don't go here. Don't go. But once we went to Columbus, that gang was different. So like the savage, like the like the the the, the Sandmans, they were more like you didn't even talk to them. Like they were like. They were that rough. Like, they would just get high in the street. They were just like, you just stood away from them. And that building, they were killing people there regularly in that project. Like, I mean, almost daily. They were throwing people off the roof. They were like, it was just, it was like, nah, that was like, nah. No matter what, you can, that was like real savage stuff going on. Now you go to Columbus, Familia has more of a, it went through stages. So it has different groups of kids, different age groups. So you got the original founders, and then they connected to the Brooklyn Familia, which outdates them. So they got this whole connection with the older generation, a newer generation, and then they got generations underneath them, right? Who then, when I go up the hill, they're more organized to where they're more part of the community. They're doing block cleanups. They're doing different things. You know, my mother was, as soon as my mother moved up there, she fell in love with the leader of the gang because we lived right across the street. And she was going, as soon as she went to the first time, she was going to the supermarket that's up there, 94th in Columbus, and Columbus is not there no more, Food City. He helped with the groceries and all that stuff. And then, and then the group will always be right across the street was their headquarters. Like that was their corner, their phone booth, that was theirs. Nobody could touch it. There would just be 50, 60 dudes there all the time. Boom, right? And they control the schoolyards and all that stuff. So from the moment we moved up there, my mom's actually felt relieved in a way. Yeah. Because we come in from Amsterdam where it was, even though she knew everybody in the street, but the next block over there was this terrorizing outlaw gang that everybody was afraid of to now move up the block. And this, this is more diplomatic. This mm -hmm. is more of a community base. It's bigger. It's more widespread age group wise. And they're not, they wild, but not. They neighbors and their kids are neighbors and, yeah. and boom. So then when I'm there, my mom's uh, neighbor, a friend of hers who's Cuban and into the same religious stuff from Cuban, you know, the, the voodoo stuff and all that stuff. Um, her son was a good student. Was he went to the to the to the um, boarding school? So because I was getting in trouble, so we jump for that. So I go. I had just got kicked out. I think one of the schools, a kid. 
I was in the principal's office for some because I, again I couldn't learn and had trouble and I was sitting there and this big fat bully kid was sitting across from me and and I don't know why I always got bullied like that he took literally was sitting at a table in the principal's office and he took right in front of me he starts breaking apart a paper clip and he breaks it half of it puts on a rubber band and shoots me right in my face from this close so it stuck me right through my ear. It actually went in. Because you remember how you used to break those paper clips? And then, so I lost it. Went crazy through the table, screaming, breaking. I ended up breaking some teacher's finger with a chair that I threw. Him, I bit him. I bit him. He ended up having a diabetes. So we had to go. Nah, I just went crazy. Like I said, once I went crazy, I would play and everything. I would do anything. I just go crazy. I was like an animal. They couldn't stop me. They actually had to call my mother. I was breaking everything and throwing things. And even the kid bugged out. I bit him. Like, he grabbed, I guess I grabbed him. And he grabbed me. I bit him in his chest. They had to call the ambulance because it turned out the kid had diabetes. And then they had to clean my mouth out with milk. <laughs> it became a big, big thing. Then the teacher's finger was broken in the office. And it was just a mess. So my mother had to come in from work, call her in. I remember it was raining. She was crying. I still remember. She was crying. And she always looked at me like it was my fault. And I couldn't understand it. Because I didn't do any, I felt like I didn't do anything, and then the tempo I couldn't control. Yeah. So I always, it was always a feeling of that, like the world was always fucking with me, and I, and you know, and I didn't know why, and then I was always in trouble. I was getting blamed for everything. And my mom's cried anyway. When we got back, um, they suspended me, but they told me that they told my mother they suspended me, but they didn't want me back for the next year. So then a neighbor, a neighbor, like we said, um, a baby, like they used to pay people to babysit the city. Like, not, not babysit, but sit kids, and they would adopt kids, and they would get all these, you know, they get these apartments, and um, Michelama apartments, which is a pro-government program, and then they would get paid for any kids that they could, they could watch, babysit, whatever, and they also adopt the kids. So that was like almost like a big scam in a way, but not really a scam, because they were genuine. Yeah. But it was a way that people could like, with no money or coming in from somewhere, make a lot of money yeah. just sitting at home, yeah. right? And they, and they would have everything. Like you go up there and they'll have every, you know, every TV, like everything. And we wouldn't, we, you know, we still turn the TVs with, with, <laughs> with, 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 oh, yeah, with, yeah. with, with wrenches and, yeah. and putting, and making our own makeshift antennas with you know, aluminum foil and stuff. Yeah. And these hey, people, hey. and these people have furniture TVs yeah. and, and it stuff would be nice. So anyway, through that, my mother had to put me because I was. She never wanted to leave me alone because I was always doing sounds like fires in the house. Like I was crazy. Like I was like alcohol. I would take model cars and crash them and put alcohol on it and light them on fire in the living room, on the middle of the living room, on the floor, and like burn the melt the towels. Yeah, yeah. My mother come home and be wondering like, why the what the you know? So she couldn't really leave me alone. So we go from that. We move into that building first. She puts me in a boarding school. No, we were still in the tenement when I went to the boarding school. That's right, because I remember, because they used to pick me up. So I had to go to boarding school on Friday, um, on Sunday evenings, and then come back on Friday evenings. The boarding school was Sacred Heart in Jersey, and um, and it was crazy because it was a big compound. They had a big yard across, like a big empty field across the road, and um, but these were like, like racist. Like I mean, it was it was bad. I mean, these people, these women, like these, these wasn't like the white people I grew up with. These were like. Like, no compassion. I mean, I, I literally got beaten like a slave. I literally got tied up in a, in a classroom in front of all the older kids by the principal, tied up by my hands like this, and beat with a yardstick, like this thick, in front of everybody. Wow. Beat the shit out of me. Wow. So that was the stuff that was going on there. They would take off, you take off your belt. They hit you for every little thing. And there wasn't a lot of kids of color. There was like, it was like, um, it was starting to. But there wasn't a lot of kids, and definitely not kids with more melanin, like your complexion. So, no. so yeah. mostly white kids. Yeah. Oh, almost all white. Yeah. And um, and uh, so and they were privileged. They didn't get the beatings we got. Yeah. Not well, because the boarding school is not free. No. Obviously, you got in. Yeah. No, it was, you had to pay. My mom's was oh, like, like I said, she was working. She, she was paid. paying for it. Oh, yeah, she, she was did. trying to do whatever she could do with me. Control you. Man. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to to save me, to I save guess. Me. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. um, to show you how bad it was, this only lasted a year. Um. But they were they were cruel. They were um, like I was sitting in class one day, and a teacher, did my, and she was huge. I mean, if I show you pictures, and not even blue eyes. They were like white blue eyes. They were really like like not even like blue. They were almost like white. It was the weirdest thing. Like almost all of them 
like almost all of them had them like that. It was like weird, almost and blonde, like real Aryan like type, yeah. and um and big, like big women. It wasn't like, and then you had the the smaller older ones that were like real nice nuns, like real wholesome, like motherly. So it was weird, weird contradiction. Did you have to wear a uniform? Yeah, you had to wear a uniform, and then and um, it said Sacred Heart as a patch. I was real little too. I was. You know, I got big later on because I started working out, but I was real fragile, like short, like I said, narrow shoulders. Anyway, um, just to show you how crazy. So that was one beating I told you. Another one I had, again, I was sitting in class and just to be cool, like I just like to be funny and be cool. You know, um, the teacher left the class. I went and I sat at her desk and said, all right, kids, do your work and da da right? And then I got up and I sat down before she could come in. And then as soon as she came in, all the kids ratted me out. Damn. Teach them. Um, I forgot her name. George sat at your desk when you was gone. Oh, and, I, and I knew it. I knew I was going to get hit. I was like, I put my head down. So she, sure enough, she called me and she said, come up here. And when I came up to the desk, she asked me, you sat at my desk when I was gone? And I said, yeah. Bah! I'm talking about one of the hardest slaps I've probably received in my entire life. I mean, wow. and I was a little, little kid. I mean, literally left my head, my face swollen and imprinted. She smacked the shit out of me. When I tell you the shit out of me, my ears were ringing. I mean, even the kids that told on me, I think felt bad. Yeah. Because it was just like, they got scared. And, I, and she was like, now sit down and don't ever do that again. And I sat down and just, you just had to swallow that shit. And then even with the food, I wasn't used to like, like sauerkraut and all that stuff. They forced you, like you was watched like, like a prison. They watched you eat. And you couldn't leave nothing. And I used to gag. I couldn't eat that stuff. Oh. And they, they, you would be the last kid. They stand there. And you're crying. You and you got to eat it. And you're throwing it up. And if you threw it up, they brought you more. And you what had to eat it. What were your roommates like when you got in the room? Since you well, they were young kids. They were cool. They were, like, I made some friends. Yeah, like, they were nice. Yeah. But I was only there for a year. Uh, but like, there was, like, it was weird because I think my younger generation, you had more kids like me. Like in that, in that class. You had okay. kids of color. But you know what I mean? Um... But not that many. And it was about almost equal in my class. So it was a dorm. You slept that night. So you watched TV together. You had to sleep and get up at a certain time. And, but because we was young, we still had that exploring mind. But the place was scary too. Because it was like a big... It was like when you find yourself going through the buildings. through the, It was like really like an old church type structure inside. And you had to go up these old stairs. And it was nicely kept. It was beautiful marble stuff. But then you walk by and it'll be eerily quiet and marble and it'll be like a church and big spaces. And, and as you're walking by, there'll be like these massive statues of like Mary holding dead Jesus and shit. And then you're walking by and the eyes always seem to be watching you. And you're walking by as a little kid and you're looking at this shit with a dead body. It was like it was real in a way, like spooky and crazy. And then in the gym, they had a... And this, I'll end it with this story, then we'll move on. There was a, a big Jesus crucified, full color statue. So it was a big wood crucif cr cross with a like a, a ceramic or plaster Jesus, right? With full color, with wow. blood dripping, everything, and looking down at you. It should remind me of Carrie when I watched that with <laughs> Carrie. So she was spooking you in the gym, right? So we playing, we used to play dodgeball and kickball and stuff like that. There was this chubby kid in my class. Yeah, the kid was funny as hell. And um, and I think he was like Ecuadorian or something, maybe even Mexican or something to that effect. And um, the kid kicks the ball and boom, hits the statue. And the oh. bottom feet, the two feet that are like nailed together, yeah. breaks and falls down. Yeah. Oh, wow. shit. That kid started crying immediately. <laughs> <laughs> And we was like, oh, shit. Him, oh, yo, he's God. about to get it, yo. We was like, oh, man. We looked at him like, yo, you're going to die for that one, man. Like, you know? And he was just crying, crying, crying. And you know, they didn't hit him. They came, and his family had to pay to get it fixed. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, they came. And he didn't get a beating for that, man. But he, he cried as if he got one. Yeah. I mean, he was hysterical. <laughs> but those are funny-ass stories. Yeah. So anyway, a year later, I, I, didn't make, I made it past the year. They didn't, I got my communion there, and then I moved back. And then I, then from there, we moved up the hill. When we moved up the hill to Columbus, like I said, I spent a year, like about a year there, a year and a half. My mother then, her job, singer, be, um, 
was moving their corporation to, to Stanford, Connecticut. Stanford, Connecticut was still like a little town. Like I went there recently and I mean, went by the train, I couldn't believe it. Um, it was still like a little town, but they was building, there was the, the beginning stages of building these corporate buildings. Anyway, we moved to Stanford, Connecticut. She decided to take it. We left the apartment that we just got in this 34 building with the terrace and everything. I mean, it was small. We only had, we went from three bedrooms to one bedroom, but it was like on this nice high rise building with a, t with a terrace and stuff. And my mom slept in the living room. Me and my brother had the room, but when my brother ended up moving, going up to 141st with my aunt, because him and my mom was not getting along, and plus in the space. And then I basically had that room with his bed, uh, two beds in it. Anyway, um, moved to Connecticut, Stanford, Connecticut. I go to school there for a year, um, Stanford um, Elementary. Uh, was it? Yeah, it was still elementary. I go to, Stan uh, I think it was Stanford Elementary. Anyway, I make some friends there. Their culture was was crazy because they were wild but in a different I'm leaving like the ghetto stuff but they're they're like having sex earlier like we, we was like perverted in a way but yet we wasn't because of the prostitution all the stuff that was going on yeah. we kind of like stood away from a lot of that stuff they were basically already having sex they already you know me they were messing around they, they already had more guns like we didn't have the guns that they had like you had gangs dudes that had shotguns and 38 special but it was rare right They that was kept out of the out of like basically the streets, you didn't just see guns, but out there the kids, they would, you know, their parents would take them on you know, hunting, so they'll have their own little shotguns, they had BB guns, they were killing animals, like squirrels and raccoons and shit left and right. Like they were just, it was just a different culture and they were, and it was wild. So I did a lot of wild stuff there, like, um, like mischievous stuff, like tons. Um, I was drawing there and I made it to the, the the Stanford newspaper because I did some drawings of some buildings like oh, they did. Just, your art started going, yeah, it was yeah. already because my mother already already had it in us, so we was already drawing. But that was where I was already like attracted to. So that's the only places where I could pay attention at in school. You it know was what I mean? Drawing. Yeah, it was drawing. So that in Connecticut because they were a little cooler the schools, they they allowed that to flourish. They had better programs for like art. Okay. So, so we was doing like going to the graveyard. They'll take you to the graveyard. It was old, like old Civil, Civil War type graveyards um, on your way to school. And you go there and do these like, they lay these papers out and you go with like a, uh, like a chalk or something over it, a black chalk, and they'll imprint um, the grave on yeah. it. You yeah. bring it to class. And then they had all these older houses that were historical. We would go around and then we'll draw those. So that's how I got into paper because actually it was like, like four kids. We had a display of these old um, buildings, and then the newspaper came, took pictures of it. It got me there. And I still have like my brace. I broke my tooth. I was um, I was in the tub, skating up and down with shampoo. My mother sent me to take a shower. I ended up breaking my teeth, and and um, any, anyway, I got forced prosthetic back then when I was a kid in Connecticut. But then I come back from Connecticut. My mother didn't make it. We made it about a year. It was too isolated for her. We was basically isolated completely. And I have friends, but she was basically just going to work and home. And, and then we would come in the city in the weekends to see her assistance stuff. My brother couldn't take it. And then we eventually, um, she was able to convince the building, because we, we had to wait on the list back then to get into the building. She was able to convince them that, because um, it was only a year, yeah. to, to let us back in. So then they gave us another apartment, um, which was a studio first, just temporarily. And then we got into another one bedroom. They wouldn't give my mother any more, anything more than one bedroom because she wasn't married and, um, and it was only me. And my brother wasn't, wasn't living with us anymore. He was with my aunt. And, and um, so basically we always had a one bedroom. And I think they just did it because they were also selling the apartments on the side. So the two and three and four rooms with the more more yeah, money yeah, so they were selling all those even though it was a government run building mm -hmm. the management was making a killing selling our apartments so it was really hard unless you was willing to pay up and my mother didn't have the money yeah. you wasn't getting upgraded so we basically spent all my time in that building up to my 20s um, in the one bedroom and she slept in the living room and I always had the bedroom what street, what street that was? That was 93rd Street in Columbus yeah. that's 100 West yeah it's a Trader Joe's and all that stuff uh, now. now it's a condo and I was a clown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what kinds of families lived in that building when, when you were growing up? that you remember? It was mixed. It was, um, it was mixed from hustlers that had a lot of money, yeah. all the way down to people that were just on welfare and didn't have anything. I have a bunch of kids and stuff. I mean, it it would like if you see it now, it's like a luxury building. It was somewhat like that back then because you could imagine the '70s it being a brand new building. But again, it didn't have a security guard. 
Um, you had to buzz yourself in. The self ran itself. Um, people knew each other. Um, there was pigeon coops on the, on the balconies because people had bitch, okay. pigeon coops on the roofs. Yeah, so yeah. people now, you had a terrace. You had a, I had a little pigeon coop. And um, so it was a different, it was a totally different lifestyle. Then you had like, you had certain families that were so poor that they literally would come down the elevator. I don't know how they made it fit, but it'd be a, a cart like this big with fruits and vegetables as if you're in the third world every night yeah. and with their kids. You know, come out of the elevator, they struggle, and they get out of the elevator, and they'll just go down, up and down the floors, you know, yelling out like you're in a, like in a village in a third world, and they and you come out, you buy your vegetables and fruits. There's a whole entire fruit stand with everything, wow. with everything. That's wow. and so it was like in a building, a luxury freaking like what would be in a luxury building today. And um, but you had like 13, 13 to 14, 15 apartments on each floor. Yeah, yeah. So, and then 30 floors. But what was cool about it as a kid was that we ran up and down, like it was our playground. Like we played in the garage. I mean, this is all pre-cameras. So you played in the garage, you played manhunt, you, you know, um, hide and seek, you kick people's doors constantly, and ran to be chased. Like you did all kinds of stuff. Like it was just, it was crazy. Mischievous. Yeah, it was really mischievous, but you yeah. was able to do it because it was so big. You go to yeah. a rooftop, yeah. the oh roof wasn't locked, and you're on the 30th floor. <laughs> you're throwing things down at people from your terrace, you know, throwing potatoes, everything. I mean, I used to go to my babysitter, so she faced the front, my sitter, I should say, not babysitter, I was older. And her, my, her, her daughter, um, who was like probably my first crush, incredible, beautiful, beautiful, we friends this day. Um, we would go, she was on the 11th floor facing down, and we was just launching things at people. And I would bring, I would grab all my mom's tomatoes, eggs and stuff. And my mother would come home from work and lose her mind. Like, <laughs> yo, where's, yo, what? Yo, I would, and I would just be taking stuff up to the house so we could throw it down and we'd be hiding. <laughs> and then, yeah, it was crazy. So that building was just like that. It was just like a fun. And then they had a whole back area. Then they had a back park. Because the government, they build those buildings and they also gave the developers incentives to build parks, public parks all over the place. So later on the crack epidemic, they locked all that up. Yeah. And then it became prime real estate now because it's open space, they could build on it. So the building just claimed it, but it was actually originally taxpayer money. Like the whole thing was a scam. Cause they, what they did was, which I learned later, I learned recently, was that the history of it because of the Harlem Renaissance and stuff, that that whole area, majority of the property was owned by people of color. Like Lincoln Center was, before it was a Puerto Rican community, mm -hmm. right? And they, they took it, in, um, what is it, intimate, intimate domain? In, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. They used that in urban renewal. So they would use this pretense because there'll be a few buildings on the block and the landlords would burn them. But when they use the pretense to say, hey, and that's where the projects comes out of in Manhattan, they go, we're gonna build these buildings for you guys, we're gonna take this property, right? And they took the property from people of color's ownership, private ownership, build these projects and these buildings and that's where you got, like I said, Superfly. You see in those apartments, those are all 198th Street, 99th Street, 100th Street. Those are those new apartments um, that they had just built. And of course we had it. So now you're coming from hustling all this stuff and you have these nice terrace apartments and you hustling. So our neighborhood was like a cool, because of that, that, that situation was cool at the time. But we didn't know that they had a 30, 40 year plan that as that generation goes, they'll be able to, you know, and then we didn't know they were gonna flood the streets with crack, AIDS, the war on drugs, and on and on, 9-11, right? On and on to where then they, everybody is pretty much wiped out, sick of living in the neighborhood, the people that were left, because now it's horrible. I mean, you live through all these pandemics and epidemics, to now you're getting offered 20, 30,000 to leave, 10,000 to leave, people are just leaving. And they were told that they wouldn't lose the apartment anyway. Like there was no wins. People didn't understand that they had leases that they were protected under. So they get these lawyers to come in and give these speeches to the, or get, like my mother was part of the tenant association, they build another tenant association to counter her. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the management was funding them and giving them promises to go against the original tenant association. Yeah. So they were able, so that's what was happening the whole time. So it turned out to be that the neighborhood that I come out in, which is now spreading, was the, the, the beginning of urban development. So we was basically the model of what was gonna be. So we the bit the first experiment. And because it was right next to Central Park, Riverside, 96th Street, all the trains, you know, the highway, you know, it was just prime. It was just prime real estate. 
So we was just in the middle of that, good and a bad. So uh, in that building, did, did, were people uh, uh, making tags on, in, inside the stairways and as you go up? They did it so the much. The project across the street they did, the, those buildings, what it was was because it was so community based. Like we did, we did, we took tags and stuff. But what happened was the porters, the supers and everybody was friends with your your family. family. Oh, so you don't want so to they will come in, like, you'll see the porter in your house come in and drinking coffee with your moms, and they'll do the repairs for, you know, like for free. Like, every, like I said, everybody depended on each other. Yeah. So you kind of like couldn't really do that because it'll get to your mother fast. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then, exactly. and then, yeah, because, and then it'll be like, you kind of like betraying somebody that's cool with you because yeah. these guys were cool. It wasn't like they were in your house trying to have sex with your moms or nothing. It was actually genuine. Yeah. Like, people were like genuine, like, really nice people. So these porters were like really nice people and they looked out for you and you looked out. So you kind of like, if you bombed, it was kind of like you, you disrespected them, but also it would get back to your moms and them quick. So early on what you did, you went more to your friend's house where the tenements were at, yeah. where nobody, there was probably one super, he didn't care, and you tagged up there and it was already pretty much bombed from the 70s. Or you went to the projects, the yeah. project across the street, mm -hmm. which there was a project right on, this is where Norman and, and these guys were from. Right across the street from um, from there was two luxury two buildings like I said one was twenty eight floors or something like that mine was 30, 30 on Columbus and then on the next street you had another building Trinity which was connected to a school Trinity mm -hmm. right and then um, across the street you had a project that was connected to the schoolyard that was connected to PS eighty four so that project you go in there and you could basically bomb it and then that's when I got that wanted poster. At 13 years old, because oh, you the, on your website, yeah, right? because yeah, yeah, yeah. because I started bombing the project so much. They had your face, right? Yeah, they George actually, Graffiti. and then George, yeah, George and they George used my real name because remember at the time that was I. Nobody could know who your real identity was, so Sen was like Sen. Nobody really, you didn't put it out that you was really Sen. Only yeah. amongst your friends, yeah. Like so, they purposely they found out from a girl whose father I think was in a, a cop or a transit. He was something, a housing cop or something. And they put that together. She basically ratted me out to a Pops who I was. They basically did that wanted poster. And it ended up being in Douglas Projects and in, my, in that project in my neighborhood. <laughs> and then we found out and we went around and ripped them all down. My friends, because Polk was in Douglas. So he saw it. We went there one day. We ripped everything down. Went to that building because it was like, oh, shit. Hurry up. Rip them down. Lucky. And you can see the original. It's folded up. I actually kept the last one. So and I put it in my pocket. Your friend ran into us, so she knew but not a friend, like. it was a girl that knew me in the building, the project. But she knew what you looked like. Yeah, so she gave that description. So it was like. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. But then it became amazing because who knew it was going to be his historical? Yeah. Like, even though it was a local thing, later on, especially through Instagram, this kid sends me one in Brooklyn. They actually made a, a, a plate of it. And there's one in Harlem. So they named it George Graffiti and Georgina Graffiti. So it became like a poster example from the eighties to the to now to the two thousands, I guess. Because if it's up, it couldn't be it couldn't be from the eighties. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I never seen it. But literally, and I'll show you later on my phone, they literally sent me two, one from Brooklyn, and one <laughs> I actually was gonna pay her to get it because they metal plaques. I was gonna pay to see some kid wants to pull it down. But because it's historical, yeah, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah. crazy, it became like a poster model for like vandalism <laughs> it's just crazy who would have known but that's where it comes from because it just comes from local hitting the buildings that i could hit but, so must have been the <laughs> well no, you know what it was with our little crew getting into that and then now i go to junior high school which right, is right, that's what I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's right next door to me yeah. so now joan of arc right is not like any other high school or no junior high school it first of all it goes up to the ninth grade right and it's huge it used to be a girls' boarding school or something. It's on 93rd Street between Columbus and Amsterdam. Now okay. it's called the New School or something like that. Yeah. And it's like three charter schools in it. Right. But this place, this thing was massive. Wow. Talking, so it was, went up to like eight floors, right? And it had an elevator. It had two oh. elevators and everything. That's how big it was, right? So so now we go from like the 70s yeah. to now going to like after the... the so things changed during after the blackout. Once the 77 blackout, that's when it seemed like the city crashed because the city was already in bad shape yeah. economically, right, right. right? So you had homeless, you had crime, you had petty crime and stuff. But when the blackout hit, it seemed like, like that's when things went out of control for a minute. Like before that, people dealt with their, you know, the old, you know, being hot in the summer with the windows open and you just dealt with it, right? Yeah. When 77 hit, it was almost like, 
it was almost like it, people were fed up, right? And 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 took it out on everything. Yeah. And robbed everything. Yeah. So when that happened, and but then after it happened, it was almost like a relief mm-hmm. in a yeah. way. So it went from it peaked and then it dropped in a way back because now all of a sudden. All that suffering, people went and stole furniture, stole new stuff, stole, and then also, as we know, the history of the DJs, right? And the park jams. So all of a sudden, they got, these kids got all this equipment, they got all this stuff, people got new gear, when you could have barely have gear, you had to share your brother, your family's gears, like, you know, holes in your sneakers, we had pro, pro kids with, in the winter with the snow, with holes in our sneakers, like, it was crazy, you had to put, put like, cardboard, cardboard. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had to sleep together, there was no heat in the tenements, all of a sudden, now, you, you was able to get a little fly. There was people selling clothes everywhere. There's clothes everywhere. People had stole everything. I mean, they ripped the gates off and cleaned out everything. Porn shops, everything. So all of a sudden now, even though my family didn't do it, but it's like everybody reaped the benefits. Yeah, yeah. So now you go from 77 to like all of a sudden it being slightly different because now people are starting to get a little flyer. They getting a little like the DJ and stuff now, the park jams are happening. Right, you got places to go with music out in the street. We connected into like the wiring into the lampposts and stuff like that. People get more creative. People are now get dirt bikes for money they sold and and things that they sold. Now you got more guns on the streets because they hit the porn shop. All had guns, you know. So now you got all these third sad night specials, these third little thirty eights all over the streets. Right, shotguns, all these rifles. Now they cut down all the shotguns. There's more shotguns in the street. So it kind of like changed everything right there. So, in a way, that's when I think going from really being poor, poor, you're still in a poor area, but now you have a little bit more. Yeah. So, now going into the 80s, we picking up from that. Now we're wearing Lee's. Now we're going shopping specifically to buy this stuff, but we also robbing. we sticking up stuff. we going to stores. We, we Now, because of what happened with, with people looting, now the younger generation sees that as a green light. Now we go to stores. And, and, and pocket stuff and take some stuff we wasn't doing before because yeah. most of our parents was not having that. They coming out of these type of families that saw stealing as the lowest and, and drug dealing as the lowest thing you could do to a family's name, right? Especially me coming out of a military family, you know, we, that'll go back to DR. My mom wouldn't be able to show a face. So it was like some, so I didn't even like to steal to be honest with you. Even when we stole spray paint, spray paint I actually eventually went and got a job because uh, delivering Chinese food only because the stealing stuff first of all they were keeping an eye on people of color at that time yeah, forget yeah, it yeah, yeah. from the moment if you were white kid it's different you could do, steal the whole store mm-hmm. but once you was a kid of color you walked in somewhere they were on you, on you. Yeah, they were, yeah. especially when it came to spray paint and any of that at that yeah. point they already they already they already they already set the standard prior to us like my brother's generation and uh-huh. the Zephyrs and them they already messed everything up for us by the time we come in there the la- and we're the last generation of the trains we become the subway train riders already already like laid it down killed it. They killed it so so for me so now going into Joan of Arc it was right next door to me my building the big building and but it, it was a school where so I'm in a, in a prime neighborhood right with a gang and everything with Thousands of kids and people now living. I come from Manhattan, I'm up the block. Now we're talking about all these tall buildings. Every single building is like a fucking neighborhood. Like yeah, it's yeah. huge. And we got multiple. And they all new. They all just going up in the mid 70s. Wow. So it's new. Well, most of these families are even new. Though they, they've been in the neighborhood, but they moving from tenements into these big buildings because they applied first. And then you got all these people coming from different areas. So so you still now it's like this mixture already. So I'm going through that mixture. I went to Connecticut for a year. When I come back. It's still a mixture because people moving in, moving out. Yeah. So new friends, new people, boom. I go to this junior high school, right? I'm 12, 11, 12, right? Going to this junior high school. And it's like like that movie um, with Clark, that, that principal in Jersey that had, had to take over a school and clean it up. Oh, yeah. Blah, blah. Lean on me. Yeah, lean on me. Lean on me. So it's like that. Yeah. You walk into school and the moment the door opens, I'm a little kid, not even working out yet. Not, I know the gang, but I'm not messing with the gang. I'm running, I'm running with this, like, f- the Fresh Five, and we're going to the Low East Side, you know, and they break dances, like young kids, and it's still just like early b boy It's okay. not even, it's not even like um, full break dancing yet. But the style is in there. Yeah. You got the crews. They got little membership cards, and and then I'm mixing in with younger brothers from older brothers that are in the gangs. But I'm not in the gang yet. I'm not made. I'm not. Yeah, I 
I'm not it's raised with them. It's yeah. around you. Yeah, but I'm not raised with them, so I'm not. I don't get a. I don't get a pass. Yeah, all right. Right. I don't get a pass. Okay. So I go into the school. So I'm still no back, really, to be honest with you. Like I got little friends I know in neighbor, but I'm not like anybody that will have backup. So, so I walk, where's your brother at? My brother's being seven years older. Now he goes to Iron Design, becomes a superstar in Iron Design. Oh, he's in high school. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then he goes on to yeah from from Iron Design. He's one of the top oil painters. He's under Max wow. Ginsburg and Max Greensburg. So he's actually Max Ginsburg's predecessor. So he becomes one of the best artists in the entire school, right? So they have one of his murals in the cafeteria. He's famous. He's all this. He got scholarships, offers from Yale to you name it. He ends up taking a scholarship, two scholarships from Parsons, one, one in, in Paris and then one in New York, wow. in which he graduates, right? He becomes a top um, book cover um, illustrator. Right, um, and he's still today. He's one of the top five classical illustrators in America. So you can look him up. He's actually incredible. Realist, he paints realist. Wow. Right. So yeah. So that's Ricky's story. So Ricky. But then before that, even with that, he goes on. He's a top roller skater in dance. He's part of the people that set up that Central Park skating thing because he goes from New York skateboarding to now to oh, roller skating with Roxy. Oh, he him? was one of the founders with Andy Kessler. So, Andy Kessler and him was best friends. Yeah, he's one of the founders of New York. So he's one of the top skateboarders. It was him and Andy and those. He was one of the best skateboarders. Wow. That's what I'm saying. My brother was like something else. He had a photogenic memory. He was just, he was like, I couldn't keep up with him. He had trophies in the entire room. I had nothing. Right? This dude, <laughs> that's why I made me get into bodybuilding later. <laughs> and I, just for a trophy. Just so that I could have a trophy. Because cause this dude had so medals, wow. everything. Wow. Like every, 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 everything like from spelling bees. I mean, this dude is crazy. Even to today, he takes a Rubik's Cube. He be doing videos of Rubik's Cubes. Just like solving them like in seconds. Like he's just, yeah. he's just like this type of dude. Yeah. Right? So, but anyway, I go into Joan of Arc. He's, he's off doing that stuff. He's also... Yeah, this is pre hip. He's, he's not break dancing yet. He's dabbling into it, but he's he's into roller skating. So he's like a, a king. He's like a god at Roxy's mm -hmm. and in a Central Park on 72nd Street. So he's like legendary. We there with Brenda K. Starr, with the kid that was in Tupac's movie and Juice on what's his name? The one that he kills first, his best friend. Um, he was actually used to skate with me, Hakeem. Hakeem, mm -hmm. Hakeem something. He used to skate with me as a little Mubai. kid. Hakeem Mubai? No. Uh... No, 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 no. I know him too, but well, he comes later. Yeah. Um, um, but this dude, Michael Anthony Hall. Um, Hall yeah, Hall. yeah, yeah, Michael, oh, okay. yeah. He used to skate yeah, with me yeah, as a little kid. We used to shoot spitballs at people. Roxy, <laughs> who's the little kids? Yeah. So Roxy, Roxy. So my brother was like this. Like I said, he was off doing his thing. At this time, I'm more again into the neighborhood stuff, and and um, again into that little hip hop stuff. I'm now. And he going, wasn't living with you, right? Nah, he was in 141st, but we used to go back and forth. Oh, you go back. My okay. aunt, yeah. yeah, in Hamilton Heights. She was in 141st in Hamilton, so that's right on the one train. You get off in 137. Anyway. Anyway, um, I go into Joan of Arc now. I'm more, I'm more, lo, lo, less it's because of my brother going, moving on, and doing his thing. I would see him, but I was more on my own. So I was more with local neighborhood kids. So now my first day going into Joan of Arc, right? I walk in. Prior to that, I was all right because I was going to Lower East Side. I had friends. I was in the neighborhood. I was in a little crew. I come back to the neighborhood. The crew was nothing in the neighborhood. I go to Joan of Arc, right, and. And the moment I walk in, mind you, this is, like I said, it's seven floors. It's massive, massive, massive school. And kids are being brought in from everywhere, from Amsterdam Projects all the way, all through Harlem, all in there, right? So you have a mixture of five percenters. You got mixtures of every single gang at the time and crews. But at that time, there wasn't Warren like that. It was actually, it was different. You walk in, we just beginning, it's the beginning stage of now wearing Lee's, and um, um, Converse, and I think it was Nike Cortez who was out, and then the Adidas, but Adidas were really expensive. But this is like the beginning stages of that, and name buckles and stuff for us. So um, you go into school, I go in, the first thing I see when I walk in the door is this guy, like a full grown man, with an afro, sideburns, smoking a cigarette, talking to this young girl, talking to this girl, and they will fly. And I'm looking at this dude like, and he was mean, like tough. Like you knew, like this is no joke. And the moment I walked in there, I'm looking at this dude like, yo, I'm going to school and there's full grown men up in here. <laughs> so you got to take it. We're going to the ninth grade. A lot of people were getting left back and people could just walk into these schools and hang out. Nobody would say nothing to them. Yeah. So you basically had like 
anything you could imagine in there. So you walk in there as a kid and you're looking at this like, oh shit. Like you can't really be a kid. Yeah, you yeah. can't be 12 years old yeah, 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 and yeah, walk yeah. into that environment. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now you gotta be a little cooler. So you go, so lucky that first, that first year, that's where I meet Pope. In my first home room, Pope comes from Douglas Projects. And then there was this other kid, Chad. It was a whole group of us. Huh? P O K E? Yeah, IBM, Polk IBM. Yeah, he was yeah. probably one of the illest of the 80s. Um, um, so there's a group of us. We sit in the back with the trouble kids. At that time, the school was out of control. The school was bombed out. There's like robberies going on, there's fights going on, the people were smoking. Like I said, it was just, it was like chaotic. It was like, Times Square. You go down the hallway and it, and there was fights for everything. What you looking at? I'm looking at you. So right away I get into fights. And right away everybody. At that point everybody was fighting. You had to. That was just part of it. You basically fought. It was like going to prison. It was like that first year you had to fight a lot. Yeah, because you can get bullied or take your lunch money. You was getting robbed. Yeah, you was getting robbed. You was getting every. And then not only that, you know, you, the girls were tough. So they only wanted the toughest of the tough. And they would bully you if you were soft. Like, you couldn't just be soft back then. Even the softer kids, you just had to fight. That was just the way it was. That's how it was. That's okay. just, it was just prison. So <laughs> with me, that's what happened. And I wasn't really built like that, like to be fighting. Like I said, I had the temper when that kicked in. But other than that, I didn't have the skills. So I would fight and I would lose, right? But I would fight. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that was it. I would, I would fight. I would never back out of fight. But anyway, from that... That year, I meet that same, you know, probably the same week, because like I said, time moved differently. I get close with Pope because we was drawing, and I was already in the Fresh Five, this crew. I was already into the graph. I got Frosty, I all these people living around my brother, you know, Zoo York stuff. I already got that. I'm already a little bit into it. So I'm writing Geo for sure for George, mm -hmm. right? And that's because people used to call me that. Like girls used to call me Geo. So I took that into as like a little tag. Anyway, I went through. I meet Polk, I meet, me and him get cool, but Polk was like a little dude, but he was also like a troll, like he would cause people to fight each other. Like he was like one of those dudes. He was a leader, leader instigator. but he was an instigator. He yeah. would put, but he could fight. But he was like this little dude who loved to fight. Like he was extremely violent. So he loved to like, like, yo, you heard what he said? You're gonna let him get away with that? And put you to fight each other. And you had to like, you kind of like fought each other. Cause once a kid did that, back then, or somebody in a classroom, somebody said something to you and, and people said, ooh, like you had to you had fight. To you you had, had to respond. Yeah. You couldn't let that slide. Like the, if, if everybody else acknowledged something like that, that, that it was a disrespect, you had to get on it. I'm sorry, I'm taking a long time right no, now. No, no, no. So, <laughs> so, so, so anyway, we sit in the back of the classroom, we all get cool, boom. Polk, he's, um, he's given a name by Kippy D, Polk. So at that point, Kippy D was a legend in the streets. He's one of the famous pop poppers. Um, who gets he gets murdered. He goes to jail and then when he comes out he got murdered. But he's the one that's Norm Skis Pritchard. K I P P um, um Y, sorry. And D with two E's. Okay, two D two D's? Two E's. Two E's. Oh, Kippy D, like you said. Yeah. And then he went by Rashawn was his um five percent of name, his mm -hmm. god name, God Body. Five percent nation, okay. Yeah, so like you would see that in the hallways. You would see five percent as Asking each other for their mathematics. What's today's mathematics? God, yeah. peace, God, peace. Today's mathematics is. And if they didn't, if they didn't know it, then they got punched yeah. in the chest. Like they got everything was a lot of crew stuff. You got disciplined by getting punched in your chest. That's what was main in crews. Every crew disciplined each other like that. Punched in your chest. Now you five percent is more like a niche. I mean, they had other games, but they were more learning the lessons. They were still yeah, bad, but they but were tough. They were, they. It's like the nation of Islam, fruit of Islam. Right, right. It's, it's like that. It's like they, but yeah, exactly. It's the offspring, but they just like that. So the young dude, the young guys and young girls that could hold themselves, but they were bad. Like they, you didn't want to get into a fight with them. And then they rolled. So I got lucky because I grew up with some of the top notch ones, like literally on my block. So and they were connected to familia later on. So we we were also exchange like. Later on, those gangs developed to where, because we grew up together, we could do favors for each other where people wouldn't know. So if he had, if somebody that we was connected with at 5% had some kind of beef, a familia member could go handle that without somebody knowing mm -hmm. why it was being handled and by who. In the same way, we get into some, it could be like, yo, take care of this, and they take care of that, and they'll never come back to 
the source. Yeah. So did any <laughs> so, anybody, yeah, this sounds, anybody yeah, yeah, yeah. in the school uh, know 120 degrees and they had the flat? Oh, man, yo, they they were like, yeah, look, I got goosebumps. Because you, got, because, because yeah. you have to know it was that. like it was like prison. Is the way prison was? Okay. Everybody had their little sets. And they stuck to this in the cafeteria. You see them building over there. Them, right? yeah. I was with Ken Swift and them was in my school. So you had these cats banging on the table making beats. And then Kenny and them break dancing in the cafeteria in that corner. And you kind of like didn't sh go to their stuff. Yeah. It was like prison. If you wasn't down with that, you, know, you wasn't down. going over there. You because you was going to get you know, fucked up. Like, what you doing here? Yeah. It was just like prison. The way prison set up. That's how it was. So you go into the school and it's just like prison. You actually had to know... Where you was at, and if you wasn't down with nothing, you mind your business. You sat somewhere and you stood out of it. But if you was down with some, then that was your home. So that's what happened with me. I get pulled into this whole little graffiti crew. You understand? Like poking them, and he's formulating. It. And then we got Kevin um, from Amsterdam Project, who be, he was also writing stash, but he's not the other. He's not the, the original stash. stash. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's not the white stash. He was. So um, he ends up um, becoming a big producer and everything with docking them from Amsterdam Project. Anyway. Um, we have Chap, we have this kid's style, we have, and we all like originals. Because remember, at that time, you couldn't use nobody's name. Yeah. You, you know, you couldn't copy nobody's style. That was all part of hip hop. Like, like, not everybody could be in hip hop, like, or be in this. Again, it was like prison. You had to do something, get in through a crew, and then the streets knew that you was a part of a crew, and then you was a part of hip hop. You couldn't just go and throw on hip hop gear, you was gonna get robbed. If you went outside and threw on Kazals because you thought you was down, it you was getting cool. robbed. You had to be down with some where cats wouldn't rob you because they knew that you was down, right? And that's where crews came in because when you threw up your tag, if you didn't have a crew, you was illegitimate. Like a crew, you were going to get crossed out and put toy. And then if they catch you, oh, this is what you write? You was getting fucked up. So the crew, so all this stuff was a different world. They all operated in you earning your stripes and being recognized by the by first your peers, but also by the community of who you was on the streets. And this so, was kept you alive and safe. So this is seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. This by ninth eight. grade, I'm already in messing with the gang stuff. So now I'm already getting drive-by shootings and we already is different. Oh, that's the next level. That's okay. the next level. Okay, yeah. It goes fast for me. Okay. I go from one, I jump from, yeah, from crews to gangs fast and then I got to make a name for myself by 16 I already got a contract put on me to kill me so it goes from it goes from like it goes from child like grab shit was serious but it was child's play for what was waiting for me yeah. later you know what I mean but the grab thing prepared me for it so I go from poking them right we go fast right in junior high school that first year within that first year boom he gets MOS Masters of Style from Kippy D Kippy D's Freaking known, respected on the streets from Harlem all the way to our neighborhood. He's a five percenter. He's down rock steady, all that stuff. No joke. He had he had no knuckles. His, like his knuckles was damaged, so he couldn't close his hands, and he would fight like this, and everybody knew it because wow. he was knocking cats out in the streets. So they always they knew Kippy for not closing his hands. Like Kippy was no joke. I mean, no joke. He's I tell black. You, b brother, black brother, that was like no joke. I'm talking about I walked down the street and you knew. Don't fuck with this dude. Even at a young age, even at 15, you looked at him, he was he was a god. He was a warrior. Like, you knew he was no joke. He didn't play no games. In fact, poking them was cool with him. And me, at that that time, I got I started getting comfortable because I'm thinking, because I'm part of Poke's crew and all that, and I see the affection he has with Poke. One day I say to him, what's up, Kippy? And he grabbed me and said, yo, that's not my fucking name. I'm Rashawn Kippy. I'm Rashawn. Um, don't call me that. And... It was something like that. Do you know me? Oh, and then, wow. and I was like, yeah. you know, I went, I went from being like, I thought, I thought I could do that to being put in place. And then, but check it out. He didn't just do it because he flipped out on me. He taught me a valuable lesson that was that I was will help me survive. He said to me, "Yo," he said to me. I don't know if he told me to fuck me up, but he told me. He said, "Yo, don't you ever dick ride no man." He was like, "You stand on your own. Don't dick ride nobody. Don't be jocking." He used to say, "Jocking." Don't you ever jock another man in your life, right? So, and now I'm just like, oh shit, you know. But you know what? He was teaching me that you don't follow, you don't dick ride another man because they're going to take advantage of you. You're a little kid. You see, you being this groupie, starstruck dude, guess what's going to happen when you get older? What happened to a lot of, a lot of the writers yeah. with, 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 
with Keith Haring and them sleeping with these young kids. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? With, with, with L.A. and all those dudes and all these photographers downtown and all these all these weirdos downtown began to take all these young hip-hop kids because they were all open that they were going to get some spots, some shine and some spotlight and somebody's recognize them or put them in a book or take their picture. Next thing you know, they're sleeping with these little kids, right? That's what he was preparing me. He was preparing me like, don't dick ride nobody. Like the fact that he saw me get so excited and not really know him like that, he basically shut that down and taught me, don't you ever do that again because there's, there's consequences to that. But his consequences in my in that time put in my head, I'll fuck you up. Yeah. You know what I mean? But later in life, when I got into the music business and everything else, I realized that he saved me from being a young person, didn't have a father, didn't really have nobody watching my back to say to me, don't you dick ride another man. Because you know what's going to happen to you? They're going to take advantage of you. Yeah. Stand on your own two feet. <laughs> don't jump on nobody's dick. <laughs> and guess what? I, I, I learned that <laughs> the hard way. I get goosebumps this day. But you know what? It saved me from years later. You know what I mean? Okay. Who knows what could have happened yeah, to me? Absolutely. You know what I mean? I've been in the same situation where friends of mine got molested, got raped. You know what I mean? And they became killers later, but they went through that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have to go through that. Why? Because from that moment on, I changed that behavior. Now I was never going to look at another man and say, even if I looked up to them and come out of pocket and let them know that. Kippy shut that down. So that's what I learned in that school. So that school, that's school, that was what was happening. So very early, you know, 12 years, 12 years old, you get these lessons. Yeah, and then I'm running with a crew. And then we start to rob people. We stick up kids. Yeah. So now we're going out in junior high school. Yeah, we're just young stick up kids. We practice the putting the sleeper hold. We put people, we practice with each other. We'll go out at lunch, we rob people, take, take, take money. their money. No, no we was robbing adults. Okay, we was okay, packing okay, kids. Yeah. We was robbing other kids. We wanted nobody, kids didn't have no money. You was robbing, we was, <laughs> we was like, you with five, six kids, you running, boom, you put people, you grab on the uh, person, and then I watching a grown man, put him in a sleeper hole, the biggest kid. You come, you punch him in the face, and the other kids are going through their pockets, and we're just robbing. So I learned that with poking them. They were coming from the project with that stuff. From there, we went on. We was, we was bombing at the same time. We was um, breaking into the to this ghost yard, which was a ghost station, to the 91st Street and Broadway. It's a banded train station. We started breaking into that. We began to do, do, do crazy shit. We began to, because I was wild. I didn't care so much about the graph. Like, I got, Polk wanted to, like, because he was being taught, he wanted his, um, his sister was dating Doves and Tell, like, so he had all these older dudes in his house all the time, right, that were writers and hip hop, all the Rocksteady cats were always in his house when Rocksteady, even Legs, so that's how I was always exposed to it early on, even Doves with the first characters, all that, watched all that. But Polk had his sister, you know, Sister Liz was no. older, she was dating a lot of those those, those guys. Those guys. Around those and, guys. Yeah, so right. she was uh, like a year too older. So she was dating those dudes. They'll be in the house. Those, she dated those, legs, a whole bunch of them. Um, she's alive? Anyway, yeah, she's, I think, in Florida or something like that. But, um, and they had a whole bunch of girls that were down Rock City. Rock, like, and, like I said, Young City oh, Boys. Okay. Originally, yeah. right. there was all these girls. Baby Love, all these, all these girls. Um, and that's when Legs and them came down. And those are the original B-girls that you see today. So little Daisy Castro, the one that sings, hey, you, the Rocksteady crew, she was in my class. I grew up with her all, like, that year. She was being my class. Yeah, yeah. So, and this is before all that, but this, this is the beginning for all of us. Like, we in there, so, and we knowing each other. And, um, and because I went to a lot of schools, later on it paid off. Because then I meet other kids that had went to school on 96th Street, blocks away, that be now in this school, and they remember me. Hey, what's up? Woom, woom. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. that helped a lot. So, so Polk, he lived over by. He lived in Douglas Projects on 100th Street, which oh, my neighborhood. Okay. Yeah, but my neighborhood cuts off at 96th Street. Oh. So literally 96th Street, you had people sitting there waiting to see if you crossed over to fuck you up, and vice versa. Familia wow. was there, and those buildings populated on 96th and 95th Street by Familia members. And then there was empty. Now there's condos there, but that was empty, um, abandoned. Um, junkyards and lots so you had like Columbus Avenue on both sides of, of, of the west side of the Columbus Avenue was empty was abandoned um, burnt down a, one shell of a building and the rest was empty lots with bricks and then the other side you had That's two going towards Riverside then. yeah but on Columbus and then so on the Central Park side you had two of the big buildings I told you that they built 
um, during that urban redevelopment shit. So then those two buildings, because they were the two biggest buildings, one on one side of Columbus was basically ran by a group that connected further up to Douglas Projects. And then this side connected everything down to us. So from that point, from 96th Street, you couldn't cross because that was being patrolled by them. And then this, yeah. So, wow. so poking them because of school was able to come into my neighborhood. Okay. Right? Because they were too young. They didn't have that beef and stuff. And like I said, people came and went. Anyway, that year, we make a little crew, poke SMOS, and that's when it starts for me. Okay. I, I, then I get Sender, and then um, Epic gets Epic. He creates Epic. We get our names from I, from different areas. We had to we had to be original. We knew the rules. Polk was really tough on that. And um, where where'd you get Sender from? Went through. We was going through back then. Every name you could imagine was taken. Yeah. Everything. Every I'm word sure. was taken. Like like it was like it was almost impossible. And then you had to find like some that fit you. And then everybody already had nicknames. Shorty, this and that. Everybody had a nickname. But you couldn't really, nicknames were already taken um, as tags from generations earlier. You just inherited nicknames. And so Sender comes from, we we went through dictionaries and looked up words. You just looked up and went through comic books. You just went through everything looking for a word that would stand out. Because again, it's not just that you're looking for a tag name. You're looking for, it's your alias. Yeah. It has to fit you. It has to be cool. And there was a lot of elements to it. So I go through a comic book. And you know how the comic books be bold in certain certain words, yeah. right? And I saw it said sender. It says something, something sender. And I was like, and remember, I'm only 12 years old or something like that, 11, 12 years old, right? And I go, sender, the sender. Like, I felt like Superman. Because oh, like Super I'm, reading, I'm reading a comic book, yeah, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, the sender. Yeah. So I was like, that's my name. So I went back, sender. I did that for about... Again, time flew, time went by so slow that a week was like if it was months, and then and then um, went through sender for maybe a month or two. Then poke doses now. The rock steady stuff is happening. The break dancing stuff is happening more. Legs is coming down to the neighborhood. There's different stuff now. They moving on. Doze is not messing with the graph no more. Those are from hard design kids. They're getting older. Like like Fable went from. Pacer, he was a graffiti right pacer in the 70s, goes into Fable, you mm -hmm. know, right? So they start now moving on to the breakdancing. Breakdancing is the, sh is the shit yeah. at that point. It's the main element, even before the rap stuff. It's the main element that everybody loves. It's, you can make money in the streets, you go to these clubs, they, they paying kids to dance in the clubs. Mm -hmm. People like Madonna and them are yeah. like taking the B-boys home. Yeah. Like, the B-boys is the shit and the right. B-girls. Like, yeah. That's it. The fashion is coming out of them. Right. Like they the ones. They the coolest. They they everything. Right. So, so mm -hmm. this is because uh, I I know during that period eighty like between eighty two and the, like eighty six Wild Style the movie comes out. That's when uh, all that style, stuff. Style Style Wars. Style comes, Wars comes out. I think, that's uh, one of the Be first ones. Beach, Beach Street is. Uh, yeah, that right? comes a little later, like eighty four, I think, or eighty five, something like that. So were you? Oh, where, where are those movies? That well, that I'm already that. So what I'm telling you is pre is pre that all happening. So it's starting to happen. Like like I said, we're going now to Roxy's and they're doing all this stuff. They they having graffiti on their walls. Like now it's like it's like it's you know I'm coming in as as I'm developing in there. That's when all that's happening. It's like a so movie see, now. So it, yeah. So I watched it, it as it yeah, developed as earlier, it but it was not the momentum wasn't there yet. Yeah, okay, okay. Now I'm catching my first year of junior high school. I'm catching that wave. With a crew of cats right, that has okay. been groomed already right, right. by the people that causing the right the wave. Okay. So I get I get blessed on that end. That's yeah, what I was yeah. telling you that I get blessed. So boom, as I get down with poking them, he's part of that entire movement. Like I said, Ken Swift and them in my cap in my school and cafeteria, banging on the tables, break dancing. Frosty's across the street from me. I see him every single day in the schoolyard. He used to swing on the swings and do acrobatic stuff. They used to compete on that. I used to, you know, they had a little crew there. They were I used to see them do the down rocks. I was practicing with them. Like we was just going to camp together. So all that is already slowly in my bloodline, in my blood, but it doesn't all come together until I hit junior high school. And then all of a sudden, now I'm being trusted, I'm being pulled in by poking them who are, who are being groomed by older dudes that are part of the movement, right? But they, they, he's, he's serious about this is how it has to be because this is the way they teach me and this is the way it got to go. So now it's official. I'm in, right? But I got to earn my way. So then what happens is we bomb it and that's where all that stuff happened with the posters and stuff we talked about. Sender, we sit down, 
Doze comes and tells Pope because Doze, Doze being his house, he's his predecessor as well, right? He's teaching him, he's doing his mugsies, we're doing all this stuff. Pope is idolizing him, he's dating his sister, boom, boom, whatever, whatever. And there's a, a few other people, Joey Tell, like all these people you wouldn't even hear about in history. Ski, um, um, all these, a bunch of dudes, right? Is that S K E E? S K I. Yeah, Black Ski. He ended up, I don't know what happened to him, um, but he's early on. And you're getting all these guys, right? And um, scene, TC5 scene, we call, we call them by the crews, right? Sure. So TC5 is connected to it. So now those is breaking into what you talked about. Now the mainstream is starting to cap, yeah. you know, jump onto the battles that happen in Lincoln Center. Yeah. Like I talked to you, this is before the movies now. Yeah. So these big battles, though, are being recognized through the streets, though, right? Zulu, you're going to the... the, the um, but the movie people heard about it and it came. The yeah. It was already happening. But, but it was already happening on a on a on a street scale. Oh, These guys scale. are becoming yeah, superstars yeah, yeah. Right. on the street scales. Right. So we looking at it like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yo, they taking this to the next level, right? So this is when the outside is starting to see it. Because now it's becoming to be where it's, it's capable to be commercialized, right? So like that, where well, because you said Joe the Ark had a kind of a Park, well, your, your apartment had a little bit of park area. Park. Everything, everything in that area. So to answer that question, right, again, being blessed in that neighborhood and having, we have White Flash. I don't know if you ever heard of him. And he was a DJ who had, actually had beef with Flash over the name. So we had, like the neighborhood, we had DJ Louie Lou. We had, we had all these DJ Bogey, Bogey. We had, we had like our neighborhood, Cool MCD. We had, we had like tons of DJs in our neighborhood as well. Legendary cats too, and um, so again with the break dances and everything. So everything basically, I didn't have to go places. I did, I did because as kids we went places, but we didn't have to go too far. You didn't have to go to Zulu Terrace. Nah, I just box. go to schoolyard and they were ready. <laughs> my PS84, they were doing jams out there. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? With the equipment, full, full fledged jams, real Harlem stuff. Yeah. So then, or you go uptown and you go and you see it, and whether it's Marcus Garvey's Park or any schoolyard. Um, it was hard because when once you went from the west side to the east side, you had beef because east side and west side didn't get along. Once you crossed the park, and they already knew the way you dressed, you already knew people not from your neighborhood or your territory. Mm -hmm. And back then, anytime you walked into a neighborhood, you got questioned on like what you was doing here. So, like for instance, on our neighborhood, Columbus, 93rd Street, Familia would have sometimes lace out the entire lamppost with all the beads and shirts from all the gangs that they will rob for coming into our neighborhood and beat them up. So if you came into the neighborhood, you got approached like, yo, what you doing here? If you didn't know somebody, if you wasn't, oh, my cousin is such and such, then, then you was getting fucked up and you better run. You better get your ass out of there because that's just the way it was. And um, so getting back to Joan of Arc, that changed because of the way the school did. So you was allowed, it was almost like you got a pass to go into these territories at a certain time of day. So like, like once, oh, a lot of those kids from Joan of Arc, once three o'clock hit and all that stuff, they hung outside maybe to three thirty, four o'clock. They were all back in their neighborhoods. They were out. They yeah. wasn't. They wasn't staying in that neighborhood because yeah. by that time, now the the gang was coming out. The yeah. regular people, the neighborhood was coming out, right. and they were gonna, you know, he's gonna have problems, and it became a different world. But during the moments of the time of school, so then Polk and us, Polk, he ended up being that I could sneak to his projects because I was with him. So we'll go to 100 Street. So, I, so that helped me get a, get a pass around. Although I had beef, I got into fights, and he did too with cats from once I crossed 96th Street, right? There was beef there, um, different times. But because we was a crew, and because it was graph and hip hop, you was able to then maneuver. Okay. So the crews actually began to allow um, the elements, I should say, allowed you to enter different neighborhoods. So if you was a b boy, people knew you was a b boy. And they, they, they saw you going into a neighborhood, they might not step to you because they knew that you was going there for some breakdancing stuff, that yeah, you wasn't right, a right. part of whatever crime or gang stuff. You was, yeah. a, you was down, you was the younger dudes, you was down with that crew. If yeah. you was a writer, the same thing. Writers, you identify writers. We dressed like B-boys, but we always had like ink on us or something. Yeah. And writers saw that. Like, that was it. That's what you live for. You live to identify who's around you. Like everybody, like older, younger. So you identify people like this. All right, he's he's an outlaw gang gang member. This guy's a mob dude. This dude, this person is this person. This person's a civilian. This is just you know you identified them right away. That was part of survival. 
like anybody. You on a train, you identified everybody. I still do that to this day. You identify, oh, that's undercover cop. That's under. You identified everybody because you had to to survive back then. Especially if you live the life we live, you just trained that way. You could smell it, right? So a graffiti writer was like one speck of ink, you're looking at the person, and as soon as you saw anything, like that that had like an ink drop on your sneaker. Uh, anything, your fingers, or and back then we had supermarketing, it would stain your hands. It wouldn't come out for weeks. So you had your hands would be stained and you looked for all that. And then you'd be like, yo, what you write? You write? What you write? And that was the famous line we had. Uh -huh. And it was like, I write such and such, or I don't write, or or I, you know, and it was always either beef. You look it you you said that to identify your friends and foes. So it was basically like you could know a writer because of crews and, and because you don't know them personally but you know that you're cool with each other because your crews are cool with each other you don't have beef with them so if, let's say I say yo what you write I'm such and such um, and right away you said your crew like I would say sin I'd be out I'd have to say one back then because I was in the other sins I was the only one so I'd be like sin IBM or sin MOS sin most right something like that um um, no, Polk would use most. I would use MOS, right? So he would say, Polk most. What's up? But you always did it like that with an attitude. Like, if somebody asked you what you write, you was like, send one IBM. Well, send IBM. What's up? Like, it was right away, like, you was ready for a beef. And then if he'd be like, oh, I'm such and such. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, all right, cool. Yeah, yeah. Or it's like, what? <laughs> you went over me. You crossed me out. Oh, yo. Do the do. It's beef. Wait, wait, which crews did y'all have beef with? What were some of the. Oh man, that's so long ago and there were so many crews. I mean, people know about the main crews today, but there were so many subdivision crews yeah. that never made it to the histories. Um, I can't even remember all of them, to be honest with you, because then the, the Famiga thing takes over. Yeah. Um, but but we pretty much was on top of the food chain. We didn't, we didn't really have, like because it came from those and them, and IBM, you gotta understand, IBM had a legacy with Lady Pink, Mares, Fables and all of them, like they went yeah. through that entire heist. That was all the scene. Like it was, it was like IBM was legendary. I mean, and it was tied to TC5, and um, and they dominated the the one lines, and and they were just like it was such an older crew that had such a reputation already mm -hmm. that when we got it, it, we all we did was was we added to the violence of a crew because the crew wasn't as violent as it was when we got it. Yeah. We was because we come out of a violent generation. We was like the most violent generation at that point. Yeah. Right. So now we was violent. We was like stick up kids and fighting and 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 and, and jumping people and, and robbing people. While they were more like, they were somewhat into that, but not like not as heavy as we was. We yeah. was so young yeah. that it was just like that's just the way we was like a pack of wolves, right? Surviving. And then um, so in Joan of Arc, that's when everything like pretty much came together. Send sender gets cut down one day. He gets IBM now. Getting IBM was like, we made it. We up there. Like we, when we young and we get, so our pride, our ego is like, all right, we up there. Like we going from, like we making our little name, but now we got a name. That's like becoming made, like, you know, in the world, like let's say the mob, like all of a sudden the Godfather says you official set, boom, boom. So now we got IBM and poke is the press. So it's like Poe comes to us and Poe was no joke. He's like serious dude. And he was like, you, 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 you gonna be down. You not down. You like, he was basically going through cats and be like, you down, you down, you not down, you down. You, you gotta work if you're gonna be down. You dun dun. So me, I was down, but he played because, which was good. Some of us was down, but what he did was, he said, he said, um, you're not fully down until you like get better, do this, do this, or yeah. do this outline. And we was down, but it was his way of making you get better. Instead of you taking it and going, well, I'm IBM now. No, it was like, you had to be hungry. Like you gotta earn this stuff. So we sent me and Epic, Epic had perhaps, he was perhaps first, and I was sent, sender. And then Polk sat us down one day, cause he was going through people and it was like, um, and we was down. So he was like, both of your names are way too long. He was like, you gotta cut your names in it in half so that's what he did he cut the names in half so epic he did per and haps epic didn't like that he went he was home and um eventually 
he went home that night and was going through records and stuff. Like, it made you desperate. Like, if you didn't like those names, yeah. and now you had to find your name fast. You're yeah. part of a crew. Duh, yeah. duh, duh. You know, I'm about to be left out. I don't got a name. Like, all of a sudden, you went from having a name to not your name not being good enough. So now you got to re-go backwards and, and redo that. And then get up again with that same... So now, the same thing happened to me. He says that same that same meeting is like, um, he cut send in half, Sender in half. So at that time, there was... So it was Sen and Dur. But you couldn't pronounce Sen. It wasn't a word that we was used to. Yeah. So you had Sin, you had Sun, you had Seen, you had all these other people. So I stood with the principle of not biting. So we didn't even look at the Sen part. So he was like, Dur. And we even did it online. I was like, I can't do Dur. Dur. Come on, man. I already get like bullied a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to fight everybody with a name like Dur. Dur. <laughs> like, nah, man. Off the jump, I was like, nah, man. So then it was him. That actually, I didn't even think of sin because I thought it was too close to sin, sun, scene, two scenes at the yeah. time, which was unheard of, unheard of. That's like historical in itself right there, that there was two scenes coexisting, right? And people knew that there were two scenes and accepted it because at that time, nobody accepted people having the same names ever. I think that's probably the only time in that era of history that you had two writers mm -hmm. with the same name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were identified by Cruz and color of their skin and also by the the line that they wrote on and that's how they would they was they would they knew who who was who but that's the only story that's the only case i could think of that you have two in history in that era the history yeah. two two coexistent people with same names that's crazy uh, so anyway so pocos he, he tags it up and tells me nah it takes sense that's dope and i was like i don't know man he's like he was like come on he threw the he threw that in there he yeah. said, he said, um, because I think I might have said something about, and he was like, nah, man, it's just like seeing, and you part of the legacy, the, the, the lineage, TC5, IBM, you could do that. He was like, and because I, I, I said that, I said, nah, it's too close to, to seeing, and he's like, no, you part of the, this is even better, this is the reason you should, because remember, we have to, we also have to, um, we also have a style that we have to follow, right? So IBM, and MOS and all the TC5, those all have a style. That's what Dez and them, that style is all the same style we, we all have, right? That's why Case 2 style is different, right? It comes from a different crew. But our crew has a lineage of a certain style. So he, Polk's argument to me to take said was, you're going to continue that style legacy anyway. Scene already laid out, TC5 scene already, an IBM scene, he already laid down your letters. So the scene in TC5 is the, the white guy? Black the, scene. Black scene, Yeah, okay. black scene. There were Doc and those guys. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's... But T, uh, yeah. The, uh, TC5, not Lee Crinones, right? Uh, he was, yeah. I think, a part of that as well. Yeah. Yeah, the Crazy Five. But he was also the Spanish Five at the time. There was there was different crews like that. TS5, mm -hmm. um, the VAM Squad. There was a whole bunch of, like, crews, crews that dominated at that time. But I think <laughs> I think Lee was a part of TC5. Mm -hmm. Um Definitely, right. and IBM. He was a part of IBM. Slave was T -T Slave as well. T -T yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of them. A lot of, them. but that's what I mean. Yeah, you know, they were telling me like that was a big group. They were yeah, also dead. Yeah, that was. But, but then IBM is like, is an extension of that. Oh, it's an extension of that. Yeah, it's Doze's crew <laughs> because Doze was part of um, TC5. Him and Ken Swift created IBM. Incredible bond masters. So automatically, because they all they made into that crew. They're, any crew that they make is a part of the crew and it takes the same members. That's how it worked back then. Everything was like connected. And so the same way with us. Since he, he put Polk, he gives it to Polk. Now all of a sudden, we're part of that whole legacy lineage. And so, we got to represent that too. So, yeah. those, <laughs> so those Green and Swift founded... Ken Swift. Ken Swift founded... IBM. IBM. Yes. Okay. Because all, right. all those B-boys, like even Frosty. Yeah, Frosty was a part of it. Frosty Freeze. They were all graffiti writers. Mm -hmm. They all, and they all was nasty. Their hand styles were, Frosty's hand style was nasty. Frosty could, could. You could think you're right. You know, like crazy. Frosty was nasty. So back in the days, he had a, a wicked Frosty Freeze tag. Yeah. Ooh, it was like mad. It was like music mm -hmm. when he tagged his name out. And think about his letters, man. Those letters flow beautiful from the first name. And because his last name is Frost, it's Wayne Frost. That's his name. Oh, that's his name. Okay. So his name, Frost, Frosty Freeze, comes from that. That's his yeah. original name. Right, so, right, right. And then because of his moves, he was known for the, for the, for the freezes. When he would throw, freezes, when yeah. he throw himself in the air and land, boom. He was known for those freezes. So that's how that all comes to be with him. 
So, but so then yeah, so we get that. So that's how Sun, and then the next day, Epic. So I become Sun immediately. The next day, boom, Sun. I'm already doing it. Sun does cut. Epic comes in with Epic. He, he was perhaps he comes in. He went through some records, found a Michael Jackson record. So the record label, Epic, boom. It's a girl. <laughs> and then because it fit him, because again, if it fit with your character epic was for his age he was a big kid and then his father died young around that time so he was really like he was like he was mean he was like tough he like he had a lot of anger and, and a lot of and then because he was a big kid bigger than average and tall and he was always mad like me so epic fit him because he was he was big he was, you know what I mean? He was, he was fighting. He was gonna, he was holding Poe down. Poke was like a little, a little crazy maniac. He just wanted to fight everybody and stab or do whatever. Like Poke was crazy. And Epic was like, it was like his henchman. He was like this big tall kid that was mad, angry, his father. And then he got shot early at Roxy's and at one of the jams, I think. I don't know. It was, but we was in junior high school. He got shot in his, in his back of his thigh. We was in school at, at a jam. One of the jams but we had community getting back to that so at that era we had a lot of community jams so every every school not just the schoolyard but the kids would rent out all the churches the, gym. yeah. the gyms the yeah. churches community all centers. community centers, community centers. Yeah. so and because this area was developing urban development we had a, every building had a community center oh. so we was able to have jams almost every single day so glenn gardens i got all these flyers um even holy name church all the churches the church on 86th street in Amsterdam. All those we had jams constantly, wow. constantly, constantly, and they were like two dollar jams to get in or whatever, and yeah, and young kids would carry records to you know whatever it was or set up or people knew you from the neighborhood yeah, you yeah. just got in you know what <clears throat> I mean? so so how in, in terms of the the, uh, the aerosol art right um, where did you guys rap where did you guys what yards you went to where where did your paint so, your good question, good question. So, for us, because our neighborhood was such a hot neighborhood, like Rocksteady Park, becoming Rocksteady Park, we had the Eye of the Tiger, we had, um, you know, that famous mural, Eye of the Tiger, and uh, and um, Sky's the Limit with the Statue of Liberty that Bill Blass, and again, again, Bill Blass, shout out to him, because he's a... That was on um, the Hamble Court. Right? Yeah, so that's all in our neighborhood, so that's our legacy. So our entire neighborhood was like that. Like, you go to every public school, had these massive murals, a lot of them from Bill Blast, Blast, but it's a lot some from Kel and Mayor and them guys before us, and and they are part of the writers bench. So me and Mayor, so what happens is, this story is not told. Um, so what happens is when I, because Polk and them lived in another neighborhood, at the end of school, after I ran with them and we did whatever we would do, I would now be in my neighbor hanging out with the neighborhood kids. So I was, that's when the Wanted poster came up. It was because I was bombing in my neighborhood, riding with kids and all that stuff. So there was a schoolyard, that schoolyard PS84. This during the time I first started, when I first started with Sen. So um, um, the schoolyard had a famous piece from like 1978 or something. It said, Que Pasa? And it was done by Kel. And um, it was beautiful. By, by that time now, you're talking about maybe three, four years later, and now things are getting bombed out. That was never really bombed. My, by my generation, it's already gotten tagged. It's chipping and all this stuff is not taken care of. But it's a beautiful piece that people loved. It was all small letters. Still remember that. Que pasa. And, and what was it on? Uh, schoolyard uh, Handball Court. Oh, Handball Court. Okay. So then what happens is now, Kelly and Mayor already, they not, nobody really knows them in the neighborhood anymore. It's already, unless you're a writer, you know about Kel, because Kel laid down a lot of styles. Kel first, you know, um, he did Kel first instead of Kel one. Um, he did the K with the little with that kick, which we we had in our style. So a lot of the styles, he was part of that whole style. Not Mayor so much, but Kel was. So then what happens is, um, in my first year junior high school, I just got the son name. I'm peace and I'm now. You know, you gotta think about it now. We feel like we're grown men now. We like IBM. We like, you know, we're, now we're gonna make our name. We're gonna really take this serious. We're gonna go bomb. And we didn't have a lot of cans. So again, to your question. So there was stores on the west side, Bombay, on 98th Street and Broadway. They, all writers went there. They had ink. They had everything, right? There was a, a store called Golden's. We would go there, try to rack up. But it was hard in those areas. So what ended up happening is um, 
a lot. But that the past generation, they stole everything, so now it's yeah, but pretty we, hard to get. But we was making stuff. Yeah. Oh, you were making Okay. Because at that era, our era, we picked up from them. Our era, mops, which was markers, were were part of, part of, um, how do I say it? Part of uh, your status. So we used to make our own markers. So the markers wasn't an issue. It was the spray paint that was the issue. Yeah. So the markers would take a roll-on deodorant, pop the ball out. So you you go through again, steal your family stuff, or go to the store and steal it. But we'll, you steal it from probably your mom's or something, and get your ass whipped later, <laughs> right? You pop out the roll-out ball, you empty it out, or you wait till somebody is finished or something. Or you find it somewhere in the garbage, right? But you take that, and we we spent a lot of times in the junkyards and stuff like that. So a lot of things you would find. That's when people were making zip guns. They were doing all kinds of shit, right? So then we'll be in school. They had the fat erasers, and they were fat, thick. Yeah. So we used to steal the erasers, <clears throat> steal all the erasers, right? And then the erasers would take them, would rip them apart, take because they each they were separated by, by strands, right? So you had the board that held it, the base, mm-hmm. and then the eraser had multiple strips mm-hmm. that made the eraser, and they were thick, and they were like a cotton or some a grayish like cotton. We used to rip those off the board, right? Take the roll on. Right, the roll on you had to use a roll on because um, because it had a ball. The caps were bigger, the top that you screwed on. The other other stuff would be too flat. You wouldn't have space. You pop out the ball, you empty it out, you wash it out, then you put ink in it. Sometimes it was supermarket ink. So that was the best ink. It was like a purplish, bluish ink, and it was from the stampers in the supermarket when they used to stamp the groceries. Mm. So that was the best ink in the market. It wouldn't come off. Like even when you hit trains and stuff. Like it was still, even if they buffed it, it was there. It, um, the only way you go over it is like with silver or gold paint. You couldn't go over it. And it would stay in your hands forever. Like, so it was the best ink. And it was called, we used to call it supermarket ink. So that was the way we used to steal that. That was easy to steal. Because the supermarket didn't pay no mind to that, sh- that stuff. And they would leave, leave all that shit laying around. Yeah. Like, you gotta do it. Any, and, and, and then you could get any store. Because remember, there was all these little bodegas and yeah. little stores. Yeah. And you had the dudes. So when yeah. the dude ain't looking, you see that ink. Yeah. Boom, you snatched it. Right. Boom. So you, and that ink was gold. Like I said, it was, it was a, and it was a beautiful color because it was like a, a purplish bluish, but dark. Yeah. So, like it, it was like a, it was not the same ink you would buy in a store. So, and again, it was permanent. It was incredible. It was, you couldn't clean it off. Like even if they buffed it, they couldn't. You had to paint over it, right? So that became in demand. And then what we'd take is the roll on. We'd take the eraser, and you had to know how to make it. You had to fold, fold the eraser, put it in, and then according to how much eraser you use, is how much ink would drip out. So the mops, you became known by your mops. So at that my era, drips. Mops and tags and drips was like was like an orgasm for people. Like, oh man, look at his drips. Oh shit. It was like magic in the tag. It wasn't just a tag. It was like the way you drip. Now, if you drip too much, you couldn't read it. Yeah. And if you drip too little, then it wasn't as so it was like a balance in it. So you made these markers that we call the mops to drip a certain way. And the best you made them, the, that also added to your reputation. You understand? Wow. So all that can fall into it. So I was like a master mop maker. I love them things. So I still make them to this day. Sin with the S drip? Yeah. I- yeah, the mop would make it. So the mop, you could actually push, because it's a racer, you could actually like... You squeeze. You could, yeah. You could, you, you press on it. Yeah, so you could actually like press on it and make more drips out of it. But that's how you did it. Sometimes it would be flooded. Yeah. You just like you just make a mess. You make a mess. That's It'd be thinking. all over you. Your clothes, yeah. Yeah, everything, yeah, yeah. and then you can't get that shit out. Then your mother is on your ass. She sees it yeah, all. and your clothes <laughs> too. So yeah. So then getting to that. So then with us, what happened with us once we started? So we went from that hitting up schoolyards. So me and Mayor get into a beef because. Oh, Mayor. Yeah, me and Mayor. Oh man, Mayor had to move out of my neighborhood. Yeah, and I was only I was only like thirteen. That's when this is around the same time. Again, like I said, in one year it's like ten years, right? So during this one period, I go from the send thing to like bombing everything to getting the want to poster to all this stuff happening, right? Right away because it's like a battery in my back, and I'm trying to earn my stripes, and I'm pleased. So that get pasta piece, right? Kellis Kim Kellis Mayor's Kel's brother. brother yeah. He's older. Yep. Yeah. So. He's the cool one. Mayor was like always like a dick. He was older than me. He was in high school. I was I was still in junior high school. So I didn't even know who he was. But he's an art and design. Yeah. And I was. Your brother had graduated from art. Yeah. 
There's a whole entrepreneur. No, my brother was in, still in his school. I think my brother was like a couple of years older than him. But he's he like graduated Kelsey. already, right? No, he was still in art. Was my brother still in art design? No, he graduated. I was in junior high school. Yeah, he graduated. He's in Parsons now. You're right. So then, oh, he might be touring. It's last year. Um, yeah, he's something like that. All right, like, okay. Yeah, it's around they, that time. But they went to the same school. That's yeah, so they knew each other. And plus, they grew up in oh, the they neighborhood. Knew each other. Okay. Yeah, they knew each other. But I don't think my brother got... Like, Mayor, a lot of people didn't mess with Mayor. Kel was the one. Everybody loved Kel. Kel. Um, Mayor was a little different. I don't know. Anyway, I didn't really know who he was, Mayor, to be honest with you. I knew of Kel, but not of Mayor. Like, nobody really cared about Mayor. Mayor was hanging out on the writer's bench on 149th and Grand Concourse. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't really somebody in my neighborhood. Yeah. Kel was more known but, in my neighborhood. But Mayor was also going downtown. Like, yeah, again, again, yeah, but, but again, he's bypassing the neighborhood. Yeah. So he's oh, in different, outside. he's in different areas, yeah. but he's not really known in my neighborhood like that. Kel is, but not my generation. They, they not knowing them. Unless you into this stuff, yeah. you're not really, you don't care what this dude is. And so then once that Que Pasa piece goes, now Bill Blass, my generation, we all knew who he was. I mean, you walked into Joan of Arc, there was a piece that says, try to su succeed. He had the Rocksteady Park pieces. You go down to the school by Brandeis. Um, he had, um, um, what was it, um. He always used record tone, um, record the um, choruses in his pieces. So Sky's the Limit, he had, um, damn, and he had something else down there. I can't remember. Anyway, he had full, he was doing these full school entrances, like the walls, like almost commissioned in a way. Like the wow. schools were commissioned them back then. So so Bill Blast, you knew. So this Que Pasa piece now is coming in as you're growing up. You've mm -hmm. seen it, but now it's already, you don't even know who did it. You just know it's iconic, it's been there, it's chipping, kids already writing on it. So I don't know if it was us, because I don't know where we would have got the paint, but but I think somebody in the community or something painted over this, or we might have helped out, painted yeah. over it. So I was going to piece on it, because now I'm the, in that area, Polka's up in Douglas, and even though I'm down with IBM, but in this area now, I'm the little... I'm the little grab dude. I'm the dude, you know, and Frosty and them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm the yeah, yeah, I'm the yeah. Sen is making his name. This is my neighborhood. Yeah. This is my territory. I'm here 24 hours a day. I'm with I'm with the stick of kids. I'm with the car thieves. I'm running every circle because they're all my friends. Yeah. So it's different circles. So and because I was a writer, a lot of them was into it and they, they praised me. So we go to the schoolyard, they paint the hand pour court, it becomes to be a neighborhood thing one day, like right after, a couple of days after. We go and we set up, I get some paints. At that time, it was hard to get paint. So I had silvers. I, must, I don't know if I racked them up or what. I had silvers and white, black, and a turquoise that was left over from some, right? So with that, I went. And at that time, we was because IBM was such a vicious crew, we was, since we was robbing kids and robbing people and beating them up, cats were crossing us out everywhere. Like, just crossing us out. Like, it was just, like, known for that. Like, they would just cross you out because they had so much beef with you. But mind you, I'm now being connected with not just a graffiti crew, right? But now I'm in a family, a gang na neighborhood. I'm hanging on the schoolyard. I'm already, I'm, grow I'm already known by them. I'm growing up with them. I'm already doing stuff with the little brothers of gang members, right? And they already made because they little brothers. They inherit, they inherit a membership. So I'm running with these two different crews and developing differently. These guys are staying in the graph stuff. I'm like now moving on to seeing sort of shotguns, you know, being around certain things, getting myself in trouble for stealing th motorcycles and cars that then Chino and them have to come to us and say, yo, motherfucker, you better return that shit because we're going to fucking kick your ass. The dude is looking for his motorcycle. We know you did it. You better stop running with that crew. You're going to get fucked up. You robbed the wrong dude. And stuff like that was happening to me. I was learning different lessons. You know what I mean? Like, big lessons. Like, yo, you know, child's play is one thing, but you're crossing the line. You know, it's grab dudes. They wasn't going through that. They were just yeah. bombing regular shit. I was fucking, in, fucking around with other stuff that was now getting me into different experiences and different reality checks. Probably why I, I grew up the way I did. So did, wow. did, the, did you come notice through to the police? Now at that time the cops didn't care about that. that was more the wanted poster was done more as a community thing with like the tennis association with the local precinct. It was nothing where they were really looking for you. It was more like to expose you to the community, yeah. if it makes sense. Yeah. Like if they put as a, as as a vandal, like you fucking right, up the but building. As you, as you got into more of the 
uh, 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 robbing people and stuff. But nah, because New York was like that. New York was like, um, it was survival of the fittest. That was just what we expected. If you walk through Riverside Park at a certain time, like the city had its rules. Like you kind of like, if you went somewhere, like if you rode in the last car of the train, you was asking for it. The last car of the train, everybody that lived in New York knew that the last car of the train was off the hinges. Like if you go into the last car of the train, you was asking for trouble. The last car of the train was designated for all the thugs, for all the criminals, for all the smokers, for all the stick-up people, and 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 that's where you went because you was down with that. If yeah. I was a stick-up kid, I want to be in the last car. Okay. I don't want to be with the others. But if you go into the last car, they know what you're about. You know what it's about. It's like prison. So you go in the last car, you want that environment because you're ready for that environment, and they know it. But if you're a tourist or somebody, or you're a civilian going from work, and you happen to get into the last car... Oh man, it's like a school of piranhas, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You asking for it. You're gonna get it. Yeah. You know, that's what happened with what's his name? Bernard Getz in the movie yeah. the shooting, right? So that's the way the trains were. So that's the way the city was. Like you didn't go to Central Park once it started getting dark. That was it. You get out of the park. You know what I mean? If you was Caucasian, you didn't pass 96th Street. You got off. You didn't go unless you really lived in those neighborhoods and people knew you. But other than that, don't go past 96th Street or 72nd. 72nd is like your first, 96th Street is your final one. <laughs> like, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. it. You at, sure. the, you at the border. That's it. You made it to 96th Street. You better get your ass out of here because you're in danger. You know, so that's, the city had its rules. Riverside Park, you just didn't go in any time of the day. Riverside, Riverside was like, was like a, a wood, wooded area. Like, unless you was a kid that was crazy and skateboard crews and, and kids that were just about it. Hit people with their skateboard and fight. You wasn't going in there. That shit was like mole people, homeless people was living in freedom tunnels, like villages. Like we'll go in the freedom tunnel and there'll be tents, there'll be villages, campfires, and all kinds of shit with dogs and stuff. And you had to walk in there with like, even as writers, with like respect because you get fucked up. Like you have to like, and they have machetes and all kinds of shit. You gotta be ready to fight. That was all different worlds. That was in the tunnels. Like you run into people in the tunnels living there. Like this, this was like it was a different world, New York. Like it was it was crazy. So if you lived in New York, you had to know this stuff. If you went to Washington Square Park, you had to know what Washington Square Park was about. If you went to the punk rock scene, you had to, and those that's why a lot of the kids went to those scenes. Because they could go to those scenes and people feared us more than we feared them. So we'll go to Dance Interior. And we'll be the hard rock. They call us the hard rocks. And we, we're only 13, 12, 13, 14 years old. And we go in these clubs and we're smoking a cigarette. We're sharing it. We're smoking a joint with each other. We're sharing a 40 ounce together. And we in there. And we, and, but we didn't behave like little kids. Yeah. We go in there. We cross, we knew our, we crossed our arms a certain way. And we just, we didn't dance. We me mugged everybody. We just looked at everybody. Those are like classic photos. You look at those old photos. Uh, and that's how it was. Yeah. And nobody fucked with you. In fact, they were scared of you. They left you alone. But you didn't fuck with nobody either. Yeah. So what you wear? So you was allowed you, to go you, in there. You wear plumes, plumes. Yeah, plumes, with plumes. not pl um, British walkers. British walkers. Um, um, pumas. I love pumas, but the, the suede stuff was really hard to keep um, at that time because you constantly had to clean and your fat laces. I didn't rock. I rocked Adidas later, like more towards '84. But early on, I loved Lanky Cortez. I loved the Cortez, the way the shape was, because it was all part of your. And yeah. Cortez, yeah. yeah, you you it was you wore the stuff that kind of like fit your image, and we we was almost we was characters. We were so young, we wanted to those same Muggsy characters we was painting is the way we wanted to look. Yeah. So even our creases and the way we stood, the way we looked, the way we put our hat, it all matched a character that we was. So the characters on the walls were the same characters we was as kids. It's and, a classic figure of that. To have b-boy with the kango yeah that's the house and then like, and even the attitude yeah, the yeah, attitude you know, was the way we was and yeah. that's how we carried ourselves so as so that's why we could go to clubs and stuff like that and they wouldn't fuck with us because you being kids you was as long as you didn't start trouble but there were certain clubs like let's say rooftop and stuff like that like i went to the rooftop and it was for like a it was like for like because they had a lot of like jazz, not only jazz but they had like a lot of at the time, like community sponsorships and stuff. So you had like, like even I think under a Cotter, he had like the the peanut, um, the Mr. Peanut, 
competitions mm-hmm. and they gave kids bikes mm-hmm. and the, the double dutch like double dutch should have been part of hip hop skateboarding to me should have been one of the elements yeah. as well yeah, yeah, yeah. and those are because Zulu eventually defined what the elements would be but I think where I grew up like double dutch definitely because some girls were like mm-hmm. incredible mm-hmm. and they were dancing and singing and that sh- they were doing stuff that was just like so I get goosebumps thinking about it and, and they were rhyming while doing it you know, they were saying like these nursery type, not nursery rhymes, but you know what I'm trying to say. There wasn't like hip hop rhymes, but there yeah. were, and, um, and then skateboarding too. That was all to me a part of, it should have all been in, pulled in, because it's all part of, to me, of what was going on at that time. You know what I'm saying? So if I think if my neighborhood would have been able to define it more, then I think those elements would have been included, because that was all a part of it. Yeah. And, and there was contests, so the city, there was a lot of social programs at that time. So early on in Joan of Arc, getting back to that real quick, yeah, I, sure. I was put on, I was put under, because I started then, by the next year, so that's that first year, I think it's sixth grade or something, by seventh grade, I'm now messing more, I'm doing both. I'm running with, that summer, I'm running with poking us. now we taking over the one line. We went from, so we went from, the subway stations, um, the abandoned subways, the Freedom Tunnels, right? Those were abandoned at that time. We went through bombing buildings, bombing schoolyards, bombing rooftops, um, um, of course, the black books and all that, all that culture is all part of that, right? Racking up, right? Now we had to rack up. So what happens is the year that makes us famous was... And it's in my documentary that I did. I think you can, I think I sent you. Yeah, yeah, I watched that. So we talk about when we took over the... So what happens is we now... We start to go up to... Koch has shut down. So my generation is different than my brothers. We talk about it all the time. My brother stopped writing because it got too violent and too crazy. Yeah. Right? And he said it. He said, yo, the 70s we was different. But it was also that society set us up for that. Uh-huh. Koch's strategy is what you would do in war. Absolutely. So what he did was they had open yards. When you mentioned the yards, we didn't really go to yards because we didn't have access to them at this point. Polk, mm-hmm. Polk went, and that's the time he got arrested. He did Polk, Epic, and West did a full car at the Baychester line, and that's in the documentary. And, they, and that's the first time he gets arrested because wow. that's how it was. The yards were like, and then by then the movies are out. You know what I mean? And the doc and the Star Wars are out. Okay. So so all that is out now. Right, so okay. the yards are off limit. Koch yeah. declares that graffiti is public enemy number one. And he says, in order to, to get control of the city, you have to conquer the graffiti first. He said graffiti is the first. This is his statement. I think it's probably in Star Wars. He says graffiti is the first sign that society has lost control. Yeah. So, yeah, I think but, that's so in the mind, in his mind, to gentrify the city first and to get the crime stuff, you have to go for that first. Okay. Because, and I understand it because we was young, the young kids out mm-hmm. there, and we wasn't just graffiti writers. We was stick up kids. We was everything. So of course you have to. We're the future, right? The older guys. Now we have a culture that we developed from everybody else. So of course, in his mind, that generation has to be crushed. And then Michael Stewart and all these people getting killed. Writers start getting killed. Cops began fucking brutalizing us. Yeah. Like they spray paint our face. They'll beat you up. They'll hit your hands with this stick. That's when they had nice sticks. They beat you with the nice sticks. Like they were doing shit to you. Like to degrade you and, and hurt you and all kinds of stuff. So they had a full... It's almost like what the cops had with the stop, stop and frisk. Yeah. They had an all out assault on anybody you thought was a graffiti writer. So the same way we identified each other... They identified us. And they had undercovers like Starsky and Hutch. Mm-hmm. They had all these dudes. So they had task force. That's the first hip hop police recorded. People don't want to see the connection. The first hip hop police is put for graffiti writers. That's Koch, right? So they put that. And as, in, and as in, in Star Wars, I think it's Brim who makes it incredible. You see how young he is? And you see the stuff? That's how he was all was. Because again, with hip hop, what I was saying earlier, what hip hop becomes to us, it's a glitch in the matrix. It's an action that caused the reaction that the system didn't expect. The system thought that it could kill off the civil rights leaders and movements of their times, which mm-hmm. it did. Yeah. But then it left a void, right? Then with the heroin and all that stuff, destroyed all the families, burnt down all these communities, they thought they won, right? All of a sudden you got these throwaway kids with no future, no expectation for us. I wasn't like my brother. He had opportunities. By the time I was coming up, those same scholarships wasn't available anymore. 
said he was broke, completely broke. He was coming off of like, I said, a hippie movement. There was like social workers. There was all kinds of stuff. Now, Myra, nah, that shit doesn't exist, right? So now you got these kids who have to figure things out on themselves, right? With all this knowledge, though. See, we're not like the kids today. Well, our knowledge is the Malcolm X's, the, the all those movements, mm -hmm. the Tupac's moms, and yeah. the you know we we got in this firsthand, neighbors to neighbors. I mean, the breakfast programs created by the Panthers. We go into that every day. We eat, and we the beginning of it. You know, we the recipients of what they did, sixties and seventies. Well, sixty six is when they start. So you figure the seventies is when they peak in, right? This is when all these programs are starting. Wick, all that stuff is the Panthers starting that. Right, the acupuncture with Dr. Matulu Shakur to, sure. to cure um, heroin addicts and stuff, and, and getting locked up. Our first political prisoners. Everything is happening with us, and we're watching it. So that's what the system didn't understand. And while they're doing that, and ignoring us, not thinking that we was anything, that we was just gonna die, right? That we just like these kids ain't gonna make it. Here we develop this this revolutionary cultural revolution which caught them by surprise. Because what happened was, instead of it being, it's coming from a place of aggression, but instead of being aggressive, it's creative. So what happens is something that the entire world could embrace and not be afraid of. Like I get goosebumps thinking about it. So it's ingenious, right? Because then it also solves all our problems. Without, let me tell you something. We didn't think about, like you didn't judge nobody back then. You know how you judge them? During hip hop? Peak, like I get goosebumps talking about this. By skills. Tell me how incredible that is. I don't give a fuck what your shell looks like. If you came to the table and you was ill at what you did, I admired you. I respected you. You was a female. I didn't look at you like, oh, I want to fuck her. Nah, she's a B girl. She could get busy. Wow, that's <clears throat> ill. You fell in love with her because, not because of her shell, because of what she's doing. Just like to the day, you see a DJ, a girl, getting busy, you don't even look at her really. You go, wow, man, she's beautiful. That's what we brought to the world. That was incredible. You know what I mean? You know how the levels of that? They can't even do that today. Adults can't even break that down and make a system like that today. Today, back then, you could literally fall in love with somebody strictly because of their skills. Mm -hmm. That's incredible for human nature. That's the, right. Absolutely. Think about it. That's incredible. Absolutely. Just like beef, we talked about earlier. You can solve a conflict with the same intensity, and same energy as a fight, or as a war, or as a stabbing, as anything. In a dance, in in DJing, in a mixing, in in spray paint art, graffiti, in a rap battle, MC battle at the time, right? Whatever, never even touching your opponent. And you, had, you could come in with the same anger, the same intensity, the same energy, and everybody will feel it as if they're watching a heavyweight bout. Ah! Oh my God! You saw that move? Oh, you killed him! Yo! And you never even touched your opponent. That's incredible. That's incredible. You know my brother, again, on the economic side, my brother went through Parsons, dancing in the streets. He would make 200 something, and this is with his own apartment. He put himself through college, breakdance in the street. He would make over $240, $80 a week wow. on the street, just dancing. And you know what he'd tell me? He'd tell me there was times that he was stranded somewhere, didn't have no money, right? He will pull out a little cup somewhere, put it down, and start breakdancing. And then he'll have enough money to get home and money to eat, just in an hour or two. Wow. Tell me that's not incredible, yeah. coming from nothing. nothing. That's like you... You make it magic. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not talking about because you want to wear all this truck jewelry, you want to drive vans. No, on a basic survival, hip hop had the solution to everything from poverty. And we're the example of it. How could you deny it? Look at the clothes, look at the pictures. We're 12, 13 years old wearing $170 glasses, $200 sheepskins, $170 bombers. You know what that was? You know what that was back yeah. then? The rebel is 100, 200, wearing a $200 coat yeah. back in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. It was like you're wearing a $2,000 coat. Uh -huh. yeah. And you're walking down a street where people are starving. They'll kill you for nothing. They'll rob you for nothing. And you're able to walk around with, with six, dollars $700 of clothing on you, fresh to death, brand new sneakers, looking dope. And, and letting the world know, yeah, I got this, what? And I'm fly. What you going to do? 
and I'm 14 years old, 13 years old, but all you got is a knife on you in your heart. You know what I'm saying? That's what hip hop did, man. Hip hop changed everything, everything. That's why I call it the glitch in the matrix. The system wasn't prepared for something like that. It was just too organic. Nobody came up and just, when they say that Cool Herc invented this, Cool Herc didn't invent this. And no disrespect to him, ultimate respect to him, right? But there was many other DJs. This is, this is, like, this is like saying that graffiti is created by one person. It's not. This goes down from, from ancient times. This is just stuff dancing. Every move is just from, it's a, it's a pattern that's already existed. Yeah, we could identify hip hop as being something, but not one person, even him, not one person created this. He wasn't a writer. So how could he take credit for hip hop as a whole? You know what I'm saying? He's not one of the original writers. He didn't go bombing, right? So how can you say that you invented this culture when you didn't even participate in some of the elements? And graffiti being the oldest element. <laughs> you feel me? Like there's a whole big thing going on. And I don't take no credit away from anybody. I think everybody, again, like we talked about earlier, everybody deserves, they survive, they contribute. Everybody deserves, to me, her deserves their, their, their praises because it was a hard time. It was difficult. But... But at the same time, you can't really, like you do it, and you do a movement like this injustice if you say that one person did it. Nah, man, it was a community, it was a way of life. It was, it was groups of kids, a lot of people died in the process of making this that had never been heard of. A lot of people laid down style, foundation that people don't even know today or recognize and never will, you know what I mean? So by saying one person did this, you, you count out millions of people that, that didn't even make it a year they, they contribute months to it, but contribute so big that got wiped out too early. You know what I mean? And it's not fair. It's not fair to them. And it's not fair to us because it's the real history and it's the real culture. People have to know that it doesn't just happen like this. It happens as a group, a community, a movement, energy, times. It's like things have to line up right. You know what I mean? You can't dictate it. It happens because... A circumstance. It just happens because the time is right. The, the the I don't know. The sun is shining on the right side. You know what I mean? Just happened to be the universe blessed that generation. So as as you move out, of, uh, sorry, Jonah, Jonah, uh, <laughs> help, help no, it's okay. I mean, uh, I get passionate. Yeah. I get caught up in that. So as, as, we, as you move out of uh, Jonah Park and start looking at high school, or even if you're going to go to high school, because you. You out there, so some some you know people have discussed high school ain't even an equation, right? No, you no. Already already dropped out, but you already mentioned that you had kind of dropped out, right? No, no. What happened was again, so so everything happens fast for me, right? Boom. So graffiti takes off, but so is my side gang thing, right? So now I'm getting in my neighborhood. I'm getting deeper with the gang with familia, and then I'm getting deeper with the graph thing. So I start with poking us. We take over. We have, we have to run, we go we go to different boroughs to steal paint now. Mm -hmm. So as a crew, because now we go to series. Now, once we broke into the trains, once we got into, so what happens is there's no more yards, right? There's only layups, underground yards, smaller ones. The biggest one for the number one line, there's one on 103rd Street, which is a small one, and it's only a winter line. It's a winter subway line. So they only, only during snowstorms or holidays, mm -hmm. they park, and there's only one, or two, one train or two trains. It's mm -hmm. a small it's very, I think it's actually one, one training part. So that's 103rd. So then what happens with us, that's where we pop our cherry. Older Joey Tell, who was a member like also with Rock City stuff, but he was a hustler. He was older. He dated also Pope's sister. Fly dude, no joke. Um, I think he might have been from Puerto Rico or something like that. But he was like a, another Kippy, like a Kippy dude. No joke. He didn't mess with that dude. But he was super cool, right? So he takes, he's with Ski. And, and I, don't, I was hanging out in Polk's house. There was a big storm, snowstorm. So we, I was in Polk's house. It was just me and Polk. I was in his house. And Tell said, he said something to the effect to Polk. Yo, you want to go hit the winter? You want to go hit, hit, a, hit a train? Something like that. And Polk was like, hell yeah. Right away, Polk was always down. Like, especially with Graf stuff. And plus, he was the little brother to them. Like, they all, he looked up to all of them. And they, 
And they treated him like that. And he was so wild. They loved that he was wild. And his little brother, Edgar, was even crazier. And he was little, tiny. That's that picture where, if you ever see us all in the train yard, a train tracks on 125th Street, you can see a little kid who's probably like eight or nine years old standing next to me. I'm holding his hand. He's on the third rail. And Wes and all of us is on there. It's a famous little picture I have. That's um, Edgar, huh? Yeah, it's little Edgar. He gets murdered years later with the crack epidemic and stuff. He is. But anyway, um, um, they take us down to the winter layup. It was snowing, nobody was around. Like I'm talking about the streets were empty. We go down there and um, this is the first time we do a train. And and when we get there, me and Pope, we were so little that when we got, we had to walk at this, we had to walk from 103rd Street into the middle of the tunnel. That's where it was laid up. When we got there, we saw the size of these trains. I still remember. We looked at each other, me and Pope was just like, I mean, these guys were like 18, 19 years old. They were, they were grown, they were big dudes. And we was still like 13, 12, 13 years old. I think it was like 12, 13 years old. And we little, we looked at these trains and we was like, this train, we was looking at each other like, how the fuck are we supposed to get up there? <laughs> this shit, because you see it on the platform, yeah. but off the platform, that train doesn't start to, it was up to here, like <laughs> where it started. Uh -huh. We was little kids. Yeah. We looking at this like, yo, but we so excited, man. We in the tunnels for the first, I mean, we've been in the tunnels because we ran to the, to, the, to the go station all the time. We would run back and forth, but going to this to actually do to be next to a train—that's why they called it the Iron Elephant. It was—it was that. It was a freaking like an elephant, and you feel the power, and it would make noises. So it—it—it it, it, it was like alive. It wasn't like like it wasn't like you was piecing on a wall. It was the train was alive, like because the fact that it could move, it would breathe, it would make these sounds. Um, steam would come out of it. Like, it was crazy. Like, you see sparks still from the third rail sometimes. It would rev itself up. <laughs> like, you would, so it was like a living thing. So you're going down there, and we looked up, and we did our first pieces, me and Pope. And, um, well, we had to climb up. And they taught us that. Like, you use the beams, and then, you know, the, the doorway of the train has the little ledge. Yeah. And then it also had like a, a, rim, a, a, a brim around the train. So we being so little, our feet's only like this big. You're able to step on all that and you're comfortable. So you're leaning over, you're doing it. And we did our first trains and um, and that was it. it what was, was your first piece, Jim? It was a scent piece. It was yellow. I got a picture of it, but it's like in pieces. I didn't get a good piece of it. But um, um, yeah, I think I think they actually helped us because um, Joey and I were just hanging out smoking a joint or whatever. And they were just like, they were, like to them, like this dude's like just a part of something to do. Like it wasn't like so serious. Like people make a scene. Like for us, yeah, it was serious, but it was also just like some, like you just doing the neighborhood. Like yeah. it was just something to do. So the older kids, it wasn't even about like, oh, you know, like, oh, I gotta be this masterpiece. Like, yeah, certain artists, it was about that. Other artists, it was just about something to do. Like just hanging out, smoking a joint. They in the yard, they don't care. They in the layup, they don't, they just doing it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it was so different people had different things. Me, I love the mischievous of it. I was more, Polk was more wanted to be famous with that name, with his name and the crew. Like he was really on a mission. Me, I was just like, I just love breaking windows. I love finding what doors and keys to use and, and fighting and seeing, like jumping. At that time, I, I loved I love them because we jump people with crews and, and work, we call them work bombs to the workers. They would come down there and we'd get into beef with us all the time. We hit them with sticks and stuff. Like they had these these sticks down there and we that's the first thing you grab when you went down there. And then you want to you want to fight the workers because you want their keys. You want to rob them. Uh -huh. So if we could yeah, jump yeah, them, yeah. we get their work key, their, their door keys. And those became to be hot commodities, not just on the street, but by the cops. If you got caught with that, Using deep shit because they knew that you robbed a conductor for it and you beat him up. And they know that you probably beat him up pretty bad to get his keys. And we did. We beat up people bad, but they beat us up too. They caught us. They, you, that's just the way it was. But um, so that was our first train. That got us hooked. That was it. That, when that happened, Polk began to look at 141st Street was the biggest layup, underground layup. It's between 137 and 145th. And that's the that was the most in demand. That was the most demanding layup in the city in, Ma in the one line, like, and then and then at that time, you had a change of guards because Black Spades was the biggest gang at one point in the city, mm -hmm. and then it became Zulu Nation, which was massive because of Black Spades because it basically just converted the name. I mean, there's there's different stories now, you know, one Spades. 
Like they'll say, no, we never became Zulu. But at the time, Zulu was fucking huge. It was massive. And, and basically, nobody talked really about the black space. They talked about Zulu. Zulu had the jams, Bronx, Bronx River. Everybody was wearing their Zulu beads. Every, it was like five percenters. It was like people wore their stuff out and there was chapters everywhere, like everywhere. And I grew up with that as well. Eventually I would create chapter 50, Natives chapter, a few years, years later. Um, but then, um, so 140 Fifth Street became in hot demand. But at the time, the biggest gang in the city was a Dominican gang called the Ball Busters. The Ball Busters came in and took over all of that in Harlem. Like you couldn't, I don't care what group you was, you could not fuck with the Ball Busters. Like the Ball Busters will outnumber everybody, including the Spades. And the Spades will tell you this, when they came in, it was like an influx of Dominicans uptown. Everything from 130, 130th or something like that. All the way up on the west side, all the way up to like, I don't know, to Dykeman or something. Yeah. It was all Dominicans. And basically everybody was a member of the Ball Busters. So every freaking house, every kid that was in there was a member of the Ball Busters. So when they came for you, and I had beef with them, this is Familia's beef. When they came for you, they came hundreds, not not 20, 30s. They came hundreds. Hundreds would come for you. They'll come to your school and it'll be big, uh, for blocks. You look down the street and it'll be like three blocks of gang members surrounding the entire school, like a riot, just to get you. That's how wow. that's how they were. And then they ran all the drugs. Wow. And at that time is when the drugs were just beginning. Yeah. They began to run it all. They had the high, they had the highway, the bridge, George Fort Washington. They brought in this whole culture of racing cars, gambling. People, like I mean, they exploded the streets to a whole. Like they took whatever was in the streets to a whole different level, and they were violent as hell. So the Jamaican posse would be on 145th and Edgecombe. They were small, and they couldn't fuck with them. Yeah, like this is like they'll eat them up. So everybody kept their little territory, but the Borbuses basically took over. So the layup happens to be right underneath their territory, 140 Fifth Street. Yeah. So here we are, little kids, going into this layup. We're taking it over, and guess what? They get they get pissed, <laughs> and they get pissed, and we fighting, we jumping people, we catch you in there, we, you know, we we beating you up, we we taking it over, we doing a little takeover. <clears throat> but we little kids yeah. and, and we vicious you know we beating people up down there we chasing them out we getting chased we running back and forth throwing bottles and, and doing all kinds of crazy shit right stabbing and all kinds of shit all of a sudden the gang says what the fuck tells their writers that's I think Flight and them which Flight now says he wasn't a member but back then we knew Flight as a member and Thud and those guys as ball busters so they telling them when they when that couldn't be settled, all of a sudden came to a point where we down there and you know, like a hundred motherfuckers come down there huh. and they block us off. And so they chased us the first time we got out, boom. We went back, right? And and then that was it. There was like, yo, we started there was a big fight, rumbles, and then all of a sudden they came deep one day. And this time they came to finish the beef. They went, they blocked us off on both sides. We didn't know that. So we were, we was used to them coming 145th and we would be in the tunnels. Once you was in the tunnels, it was like, it was like art of war. They'd be on the platform having to get in the tunnels. We were already in the tunnels, so we were able to hold them off, right? In that yeah. territory, in the tunnels. Yeah. And then in there, there was so many tracks and so many trains parked and it was so long. Like, so you basically could be like fighting and running, fighting, ducking, hiding those different rooms, different staircases that led to the streets, different old rooms you could hide in. It was, it was just crazy. And we knew it. Yeah. We learned everything in there. So we had the, we had, even in their territory, we had the upper hand because we was these young kids and we explored everything. So that made it hard for them to get us out. It's like, it's like having termites in your house you know what i mean how you get them out of the wood you know they're there you kill a bunch of them but you can't really get rid of them so, how do you guys paint if it's so much drama you that's paint. that's how it was so certain members like poking them be painting most of the time and the cats like us like me holding off the other be, be walking around patrolling oh, going and okay. we'd be we'd be in bomb we'd be bombing inside but watching everything going through the cars while they painting over here in this section we're all over the place going around playing around. So that's why a lot of us didn't get up the way certain cats got up at that time. 
what we do also, we would we would help fill in real quick, yeah. like certain backgrounds. So you did it like that. Sometimes you did pieces where it would be like like they doing today, like two or three guys. But mm -hmm. mostly everybody did their pieces. But as a crew, like if you had to get in really quick, you'll fill this in for me real quick. You fill in, but he already started it, and it's his outline. So it's really his piece. You didn't take credit for or the crew, you know. But it was a crew. Like later on, now I saw a lot of people ego say. Or he didn't do his piece. I did it, you know. And that was crazy because to me, as a young crew, we we took care of each other. Like, yeah, yeah if you filled in my piece, it's still my piece. If I filled in your piece, I'm not taking credit for your piece. It still says IBM or it says MOS underneath it. It's, it's right. still ours. It's, right. it's not your just yet. You didn't yeah. do it alone. Yeah. Like, yes, yeah, your name, but you had a whole crew fighting for yeah. you yeah. down there. Right. You know. So for me, again, I was more into like the violence, the the breaking things exploring things and so when that stuff happened I always had heart already I wasn't big yet I wasn't working out yet Epic was big but me and Epic really held things down because we came up together by then Polk had a lot of other members we had a lot of members and we was meeting up with other writers on 145th that then joined with us because they had the same beef so we had like Little Men Little Man Scent S-E-N-T we had Shaw Man was down with us all the time Shaw Man was from Uptown and he was brolic as a young kid he was he was like, his genetics was, he's a genetic, he just passed away recently, I heard. I didn't even get to see him since we was kids. Um, but he was like a genetic freak, black brother, like just built, like a young kid looking like a bodybuilder, you know what I mean? And he was known, so we, we teamed up, with FBA was a crew we teamed up with. So then what happened was, we heard that they was gonna come roll up on us, the ball busters, they were, they were fed up. We already got into stuff with them, and it got to the point where on this specific day, we was like, we called on all these different crews to help us. No, no, no. Actually, that came right after. So what happened was, on this specific day, they roll on us. And we ready. We have like maybe 15. So we think we got enough. So they come down. We, could, we, we had spots, people that were spots. So the day. So when we come down, they would have somebody in the platform that would run upstairs and go, yo, they here. Pope, Epic IBM kid. Boom, boom. Right, and that's when the beef would happen. And we also had spotters when we painting to be at the at the at the at the platform on one of the benches, keeping an eye out. So that was the way too. And that also kept you from the cops, you know, the the spotters. So you needed that. So that's how a whole crew worked. So on this specific day, I don't know. We was I remember we knew. I don't know where I was at, but I don't know specifics because we were so big. We would go came together, right. And we used whistlings and different kids used different things back then to, 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 to call on each other. Like certain whistles that came from the neighborhood gangs. Like if you heard certain whistles, it meant there's beef. If it meant certain whistles just meant I'm here and you knew who it was. Like you just kind of like communicated differently from, you know, distance. So anyway, on this specific day, there's a mob coming on the platform and we ready. We get there, we grab our stuff. Yeah, we like, yeah, we're gonna fight like a rumble. Yeah, we're gonna fight, right? And then all of a sudden, we were coming towards them with sticks and bats and I think machetes. I think one of the kids had a machete. And we walk in towards them and they bigger kids, they pull out guns and start shooting at us. So we take off running. Like, and then we run and now it's scary. Now we go from, yeah, yeah, to like a reality check. Like, yo, we're gonna they're gonna kill us down here. Like, this is serious. Like, we start ditching our shit. We start running. Cats are scattering. They're going under trains. Cat, they look in ways. So, no, actually, our first instinct was to run to 135th. So, we run through the whole thing, <laughs> run past all the trains. We run it down the, tra the tracks. We get to, we get into 135th Street. There's another mob there waiting for us. Wow. So, we had, we like, oh, fuck. We turn back, run back. And then everybody scattered. Cause it was kids scattered like rats right and i know poke and a couple of them they made it by hiding underneath the trains and stuff because they were little me and a group a group of maybe eight or nine kids it was like 130 something street there was a emergency exit thing on the street we we knew we ran up in the middle of the of the track of the of the layup we knew that there was an exit we ran up the stairs you see that in Star Wars, like when they had those stairs and the big flap open yeah, something. Yeah, and then we yeah. came out on Broadway in the middle, like almost in the middle of the street. There was traffic coming. The thing opened up. We got out. Boom. And we was like, yo, this is crazy. And we was outside. Lucky they wasn't really in the streets waiting for us. Yeah. They just was dealing with the, the shit downstairs. And then we went to the store. We got some chips. We talked about it. 
And then we went back down there after that. After like an hour, we just hung around and we went back down there to see if anybody was hurt or anything. And then we basically, there was nobody down there. We went and we, we got out of there. And then I met Polk around the block later. He escapes his way, I escaped my way. But that's how it was by Naira. So it was hard to paint, it was hard to piece. And then we, to still paint, we, we had a legendary, a bunch of pieces that we did. That's that nice clean send that you, that I just posted recently. So what happened was, we ended up going to the Bronx deep. Like, it was like an Italian neighborhood. And it was like deep. It was like last stop of the train and you had to walk for, for miles or something. We just, we just took the train to the last stop and walked. It was like sad night fever in a way. Like a little mom and pop stores and it was all Italians and stuff. But it was like a working class, older neighborhood. It wasn't really like we had to worry about any danger. And then we went up there and we found like, we went into this hardware store and there was a very old man in there. And we went and we racked up. He wasn't on it. He wasn't on us. And we went and we racked, I mean, we racked up like crazy. But he had, he had all this old paint. Like they were old. And then we didn't really notice. We just grabbed, grabbed, grabbed. We grabbed so many cans. I think it was like 30, 40 cans. At that time, it was a lot. And um, when we got back home, we go to split it out. We go to split it up. We had all these rare colors that were no longer being made. Plum purple. I still remember them. Pineapple yellow. School bus yellow. Um, there was like all these colors. Um, hot pink. Um, but it was called something else. But it was all these colors that were not being made anymore so it was like so when we that following week when we went that's when Pope went off because now we have all this paint I went off did my thing we did we, we was comfortable we had all these colors and paint that we go down there in peace and by that time we already squashed oh what happened with the beefs we they we, we went back after like the following week so the ball busters gave up on it they were like you know what oh no no what happened was this is what happened other gangs Zulu FBA, all of them heard about that. So now all these other gangs came and backed us up because they oh, had wow. beef with the ball busters. So wow. then what happened was because they went down there that one day and we showed a force, then it got squashed. Yeah. So then there was a, like the ball busters didn't want to deal with that. That to them, they were drug dealers. They were gangs, real gangs. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, like, yeah. that's like their low level shit, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So they basically, their writers basically squashed everything with us. And then that opens a new chapter because then flight and number with us now everybody's cool, more writers, and we're getting along. We're able to piece nicely, and that's when we meet Wes. Wes, as you know, is now, he's the one that created PMB clothing line. He's behind Supreme. He's all of that. But Wes, he's a, he's a Russian kid from our neighbor further down. He's, he's with Flight and them. Meets up with Pope that day. We take him in. We ride the train downtown together. The history is made there because then they team up, and he starts FC, first class which is now the front runner, I think, Graffiti Crews. Um, um, and they go on to doing West and Pope pieces like crazy. And it basically like it was a representation of both crews. So then IBM gives gives credibility to FC, which then FC then later on, when we when we stop bombing, Pope goes to jail, because our crack goes to jail, I, I get into the gang and drug stuff. West and them continue off of where we left them. 145 and gets the cycles, the the Zeers and all those writers, and then they become and they're the ones that did the jungle. They they all over the Martha Cooper books. They did um what was that piece? Jungle something and um with the palm tree and all that is one of the books. But they end up they end up now making a whole legacy right at the end, right before the trains get shut off. Mm -hmm. And a whole crew of legends come out of their whole thing. You know, so it's like it's crazy how that one thing, everything just continued to to so it's kind of like an offshoot. It just so continues. New, new guys. Yeah, yeah, it just continues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I remember PMB. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then later on, when he graduates from school, he, he creates PMB, yeah. which is the biggest clothing line at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. all that continues, yeah. And then those members like Keo, all those dudes were all part of that. So they become like an extension of us, our family, another crew. IBM. So, yeah, it's all, they all IBM, Risk, all of them, and they all, but they all FCs. They all... Their crew is FC, but they all foundation is IBM. IBM FC stands for what? Um, first class. Um, they call it, they say first class kings. Um, they have another because all those names like Pogue, even IBM. He put it in, um, um, idolized by millions. They they change like it stays change. as one yeah, official yeah, name, yeah. but they always they always make it. They always use it. So it's first class, and there's another one um, that they always use. I can't remember at the moment. But um, yeah, so that that's that um, with that part. I mean, there was incidents like 
So before we got to like really like like when before I, I said that train when we did our first train, we started it's called motion bombing. So we would take the train because we was on 96th Street, we would get on a train and we would take it all the way to the last stop and we'll be bombing. Again, by the time rush hour was over, nobody was really riding the train because it was just too dangerous. Yeah, so yeah. people went straight home from work. And back then it was a nine to five gig yeah, right, mostly. Right, right, so right. people would just basically go home. After rush hour, the trains were like empty. And we would just go and with the mops and all that, we would bomb the trains all the way all the way to the last stop, switch, grab another train, ride it down. Depending depending on the night, we would just ride them up and down two or three times and all the way to the last stops, all the way to South Ferry, back, you know, and bomb it out until we got tired, until we had to be home. Mm-hmm. Right? And then, uh, but during that process, we would um, kick our windows in the elevator. When the trains would be elevated, we would kick the windows out, psh, watch it fall down the streets. Like, we was doing, like, crazy shit. We would, <coughs> when we had to get a one, just for fun, we would, because we could jump into the tracks, we would, um, certain stops, we would just, the trains flying, we would pull the emergency brakes. <laughs> And watch everybody in the train fall. That's crazy, like, yeah. Kid yeah, shit. yeah, it was crazy. We were riding the outside of the train. We'd be in between the cars sitting up on yeah, it. That was crazy. Like, it was wow. crazy. But it was just like, oh, that was like fun. We just do it out of, like sometimes, like I would do stuff like that, like without the crew even knowing. Like I'd be watching them and I'd just go and just do it. Just, hey. just oh, what the fuck? Why are you always doing that shit? And then we had to run, we jump, and then the train wasn't going nowhere. Yeah. So you just went between cars, jumped in the track, and you ran to the next stop, and basically everybody be pissed. And then the conductor <laughs> be cursing at you, and you'd be like, fuck you. And you'd be running to the next stop laughing, <laughs> laughing, <laughs> laughing your guts out, man. It, just, oh, it was wow. funny. But people would fall there. That's when they started putting that stuff on and they started. Oh, so you couldn't do it. Anymore. Yeah, but we, that was like a regular thing. And then with the gang stuff too. When I got older, when I went to. So, all right, let's get into so you're that. You're coming out of junior high, right? But well, let's see, how are you doing, man? Because you, you, you spoke three hours. So maybe. Let, let's do another half an hour. Is that cool? Well, yeah, so you have, let me, you have six o'clock. So Pause. yeah, well, we'll close at five. Oh, no, so no, six. no, that's, that's fine. Start. I just we don't know if it. I have enough battery to, to go another um, half hour on this because this one. I, I Damn, I'm, I, I got into too much. Huh? No, no, not at all. This is great. I go right? No. I, I mean, I, I, I go whenever. Yeah. All right, all right. So this, right, we'll so, knock this out. Uh, okay, so as you, you you're getting older, you're getting you know you get ready to go to high school, providing you pass a grade. You mean that? The nah, nah. But, but anyway, you, you're getting older, you know, your friends are moving on, and then you're, you're saying, okay, you're going to start leaning towards criminality, we, we could say, well, gang, gang life. So, yeah, so in my neighborhood, we had a, a car th- theft ring on this guy named Dottie who passed away. The cops, he was a famous case. The cops beat him up at one point, broke all his face. and everything. But anyway, there was like a young crew that I grew up with. And they were car thieves and motorcycle thieves. Like, we was doing this shit since young. And um, part of the story I told you earlier with Chino and them warning us about stealing somebody's bike. Like, we was really young doing this stuff. Is that and the famous graffiti guy, Chino? Or no, no. Nah, nah, Chino is Familia. It's another... Another Chino? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, um, but he's legendary. Like, outlaw gangs. He's definitely legendary. Um, but anyway, um, so we was already neighborhood thieves. And we used to steal a lot of stuff in that area. And, and we had a parking lot. So anyway... Um, so that was one, so that ring, so the main dude, his brother was a Familia member. Like I said, most of the kids I was running with was Familia members. So during those summers, so during those years, like with the Pope thing, I started outgrowing. Like when Wes and them started getting involved, mm-hmm. and then Pope began to get high more. And then, like I said, he was from the Douglas Project. He was like, like I'll say, I was on 93rd Street. He was almost about eight blocks away from me and different territory. So by the time, like, there were certain times I just wasn't seeing them, like wasn't even, and then I was losing interest in that because now um, I was hanging out more, going to these jams, but now with these gangsters, and the gangsters had it all, like all the girls, all the respect. Not so much at that time. It wasn't. We was all basically the same. The drugs wasn't big yet. Oh, wasn't big. Okay. But what it was was reputation wise. Yeah. Reputation wise. Like they could walk big. places and nobody yeah. fucked with them, and you know I wanted that. You know what I'm saying? And and um. And I, and I was lucky because, I, again, I was putting the same thing like just poking them. I was put in the right position where, like, my closest friends, their older brothers were, like, the biggest gangsters, you know what I mean? From Familia, like, Al Capone and all these dudes. And these dudes were, like, like people feared them. I mean, even uptown, no matter where they went, like, these dudes were, like, no joke. Like, people feared them. They knew. 
and they wow, they they deserve, they earn that, and they will fight. And then Chino, what ends up happening is that Chino didn't like me, and then because I was I was I was more of a troll maker. I was running with them, and it kind of like got to my head because I was living in the block and and running. But I wasn't. I took it for granted that these other kids, their brothers were members, so they automatically were like made. You know, I wasn't. But I, because I ran with them and I'd be in the house and, I, and I'd be jumping people with them here and there, stuff, I felt like I was down. And then I got a reality check because what happened was, as I start going, so by the time Joan of Arc, by the time I hit eighth grade, it went up to the ninth grade. By the time I went to the ninth grade, now I'm more, I'm, I'm, I'm not really fucking with the graph thing. Not with because, Pokemon. Nah, because poking them were like, now I'm outgrowing them. Okay. And it's status, street status. Yeah. And Poke, Poke didn't really like that because he wanted to be always the the man. He had this ego, this ego thing, right? And and he got beat up by a dude on my block that was close to me. So I think a little bit that began to put him in his place with, when it came to like authority over me, let's say with me. And now I'm getting, I'm more around some real cats to yeah. say meaning street shit. So he, he kind of like rather be with Western them who were like, like looking up to him still. Me, I'm now starting, you know, get into rumbles and fighting and and get my respect on a different level that he couldn't get. And um, and I'm with people that wasn't showing him the love that they were showing me. But what happened was, so I go through eighth eighth and ninth grade again. There's a school year, then there's the summer neighborhood stuff. I was then already classified as a gang member because of school and stuff. Because of me, that's reputation. So I had to go to like social programs. They had a, this organization called I Cry Inner City Roundtable of Youth, some shit like that. Okay. So it was like down by Chamber Street. So the courts would, the, in the school system, would certain kids were on a list. You had to attend to these, these things. So I had to attend to that. I got a card and everything where I had to show up. So. Well, did you get the classified card because you were just hanging out? Oh, you actually did some damage. Nah, I was doing damage, but I wasn't considered a member yet. Oh, okay, okay. Because remember, so now, just to give you a familia breakdown, it's like a mafia. So you got 1974 cats who are older, and they're more the outlaw dudes. And they, they operate like that. They run their own little drug trade, like the Hells Angels. They got their own organized crime going on. Then they got a group underneath them, right? That's close to them, but also, but they they not as wild. They're wild, but they're a little calmer. And they got a football team. And they and they big dudes. Some of them are going to college. They they're just big. Then you got another tier, right? And these are the older brothers of my friends. They consider the wildest, the wildest group, mm. right? They in high school. They the wildest ones. They the ones with all the rumbles, all the fighting, all, all the beef is basically starting with them. They're like soldiers. But then we are the younger soldiers coming up. Younger so soldiers we look, coming and up. And then we looking at them, and they the wildest out of the whole group. So now we the wildest. So we doing the crazy shit, but they got our backs. Yeah. So so you know what I mean. So any so even the crew, even some of the older ones didn't like that because it was too much power, too much egos, and too much beef coming from these two tiers, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. And, and then they would all have to get involved because Familia wasn't a big big gang. It was just a loyal gang. It was it was chosen. You didn't like. It wasn't like you had to grow into it. It was it was like a mob. It was like a, a family thing. You couldn't. It wasn't like somebody could just get down. It was it was almost it was impossible. That's right. why I survived with no snitching, no nothing. We didn't, we didn't, we survived it all because it was homegrown like that. Okay. And, yeah. and then the rules were the rules. Like you knew it. It was like the mafia. So it was like and you grew up knowing this stuff. You know what I mean? So then what happens with me is that is that during that course I'm getting into all the beasts with all the younger dudes. We and all that. So then, and then 